ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Angelo Ferrante, Secretary General of MET TSO. Uh, it is a real pleasure for me to welcome you to this webinar organized jointly by MET TSO and MEDREG. Uh, the title of the webinar is uh, uh, Enabling Electricity Exchanges mm -hmm. and Trading in the Mediterranean. And it clearly shows uh, its purpose, that is to address the main hurdles to be tackled and overcome to enable electricity exchanges and trading in the uh, Mediterranean. The region is not homogeneous, uh, you know, uh, because it includes European countries that are uh, under the umbrella of the EU legislation. There are uh, other non-EU countries who have anyhow uh, committed to adopt uh, integrally or partly the EU legislation. And other countries may look uh, at Europe uh, as a reference, but without any uh, binding uh, uh, approach. Uh, so in this context, I think it's very likely that a one size fits all solution for integration does not exist. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the DSO challenge, and I would say also from MEDREG, is to promote multilateral cooperation as, as the key for finding solutions that can be implemented in practice. Uh, I think that the integration of power system uh, is a key driver for achieving the energy transition in the Mediterranean region. And it is no more an option, but a necessity uh, because it allows to reduce the market fragmentation, to share uh, balancing resources, to uh, take advantage of the uh, regional uh, complementarities. But the integration is made of hardware and software Developing the grid is one of our main uh, objective, and it is the hardware, but it is not enough. We also need the software, the rules. So in this year, we have been working on the setup of harmonized technical frameworks uh, as far as METSO is concerned in the Mediterranean, in, in the first and the second Mediterranean projects that have been developed so far. Uh, in the current TZMED project, we intend to go uh, further uh, by defining the guidelines and the main chapters of a Mediterranean grid code. Uh, and in this perspective, the uh, institutional engagement and the stakeholders' support are of paramount importance. This, this is why we are organizing this uh, joint workshop. Uh, but uh, let's say uh, harmonize technical and regulatory frameworks are a mandatory condition, but uh, how, how to get there? Uh, we have many distinguished speakers in this webinar. I welcome uh, all uh, very much. There is a first session where we gather experiences and best practices uh, on power system integrations from various parts of the world. And then a second panel where we discuss what are the main gaps, what is missing, and what are the actions that must be performed to activate the right process in the Mediterranean. Uh, I, I don't want to take away any more time from the debate, so uh, I leave the floor now to my friend Hassan Holtzkoch from MEDREC for his opening welcome. Uh, I can only thank you uh, again and hope you will enjoy this webinar. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, have a nice day. Hassan, if you want yeah. to say something. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Angelo. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues, dear friends. Uh, welcome to our webinars. And I hope uh, this would be one of our last uh, online webinar and i hope we will be able to meet uh, physically to see each other definitely the impact is different angelo you have already summarized our main objectives uh, and the long-term strategy for the mediterranean uh, region indeed uh, let me just uh, underline once more as you may know that uh, our main objectives as MEDREC Mediterranean Energy Regulators uh, is to promote uh, a harmonized, uh, 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 non-discriminatory and compatible energy regulation with a view to ensuring a stable, sustainable, secure and competitive Mediterranean energy market. There uh, are, uh, in order to create a fully functioning uh, Mediterranean energy market, you need uh, two important elements. Angela has already uh, uh, highlighted, but it's better to highlight once more. First, you need a compatible and harmonized regulation. And secondly, you need uh, an interoperated and integrated energy infrastructures. Without these two, we cannot uh, be able to uh, 
make the energy exchange and trade, trading uh, among the countries. So basically, both organizations, we are really hardly working to create a fully functioning and interoperated Mediterranean energy market. In the end, this will bring ample benefits, uh, ample benefits to each countries in the region. So therefore, today we are going to discuss uh, what are the missing elements, what are the regulation is uh, needed, and uh, we, what we can do together to bring our powers to create these, uh, let's say, the long-term objectives to have a functioning Mediterranean energy market. So we have uh, several distinguished uh, speakers, and they are going to share uh, their recent developments in the recent, uh, let's say, the region. So in the end, uh, we hope that uh, this webinar, uh, this workshop, the joint workshop with our, let's say, the, 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 the partners uh, met the So uh, I hope all the uh, participants will benefit and it will be beneficial and efficient for all of you. I would like to thank you very much. And now uh, would like to leave uh, to floor to uh, my colleague uh, Florian from the from the European Commission DG uh, Ener for uh, his uh, keynote uh, speech, and then it will be followed by Harve from the Met DSO, and then it will be followed uh, into these two uh, sessions. I wish you all the best. I hope it will be very efficient and fruitful workshop. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to to be with um, with you because this is this is so important. This is um, this is really about uh, creating an an internal market um, ultimately together with um, with you. And I can tell you how um, um, how beneficial it is to have such uh, such internal market. Um, and I I myself um, had the pleasure over over some years to to manage the. Um, uh, adoption of of the network rules and network codes at the at the European um, Union level. So so from that point of view, I, I talk here really from from experience. But but first of all, um, I think we should always keep in mind um, how beneficial it is to have an internal electricity um, uh, market. This um, uh, leads to system efficiencies um, in the worth of, of um, several billion of euro in the in the European Union. Um, it um, facilitates tremendously the integration of variable renewables. That's that's the topic of the of the future. How, how do you integrate wind and sun into the electricity system? And I can tell you, um, do it with a with a uh, common electricity market. It will be uh, much, uh, much better. And then finally, um, <clears throat> such market increases security of supply at least costs um, for, um, for all of us. And, uh, and there's absolutely no, no reason why this should just work at the European uh, level. Yes, we have the biggest and most developed um, electricity market in the, in the world. But, um, but we, we know from, from our cooperation, our international um, outreach, for example, to, to China, how beneficial it would uh, also be there to have such an uh, electricity market. And I spent myself a week uh, there to talk to government officials and, and think tanks um, uh, to, to promote a bit that, that, that system. And in the meantime, we, we, hear, we get very positive um, signals in that sense from, from Beijing that, um, that they are adopting more and more those uh, electricity uh, market design um, rules and, and framework and concept as um, as we think is um, is very useful, and um, uh, we are extending the electricity market um, as you probably know to to the Western Balkans, to Ukraine, so so the eastern uh, neighborhood of uh, of Europe with the support of the energy community, and this works uh, works very well. We we are looking at market coupling projects as I as I speak. And um, this just improves the market overall if we have a big market. And I, I couldn't think of anything better than having the possibility to have a joint market um, based, of course, on, 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 on common structures and, uh, and rules in the, in the Mediterranean. Um, so um, as you have mentioned uh, already, the precondition for, for any such market 
is uh, is the hardware is the infrastructure you you cannot build really a market if you don't have the connecting infrastructure you need a modern um, uh, transmission system a distribution uh, system that, that this goes by itself but what um, people indeed often forget and i i see this also at the various cop um, uh, discussions um, infrastructure alone won't uh, help you uh, help you much. If you do not have um, a common uh, regulatory framework, you won't be able um, to use efficiently your um, your infrastructure. So that's uh, that's important. And if we look at the common framework, then um, the basic rules need to to fit before we discuss uh, network codes. Um, the general principles. Of, of the market um, uh, should fit a uh, clear definition of the role of, of TSOs. Um, unbundling uh, uh, has proved to be very valuable and key to create a market. So the, the separation of, uh, of transmission, distribution on the one hand, and uh, supply and trade on the, on the other hand. Uh, with uh, years of experience without unbundling, we know that you won't have an efficient market um, without uh, unbundling. This implies, of course, then the full uh, equal access uh, right to the to the grid for for all. This implies independent regulatory authorities. To name now here only some of the of the pillars of uh, of good regulation, which uh, I guess you are aware of. Now, um, if you have the basic principles on that um, uh, uh, basis and and link to to this, um, one then with our experience need to go a step further <clears throat> and look on on the best use of of the infrastructure capacity. <clears throat> with a, a market opening supported by the system operation and of course um, system uh, security and and hence and this could be very well done by the um, by the network codes we have started in the eu um, this network code project uh, based on what we call the third um, internal market or third energy um, package um, in at around 2009 we had then the initial um, time limit, which we gave uh, to ourselves of 2015, but we had a delay of, of one or the other year, year to have really all the network codes in, in place. And, and this is a lesson we learned from, from the process. Um, uh, the network codes, this is a highly technical, um, uh, complex demanding um, uh, issue, but on the other hand, it is um, uh, also very political. So um, what we really learned from the process of making network calls is that, um, that um, uh, technicians um, need to go hand in hand with the politicians to simplify. Um, so it, it doesn't make sense if, if one camp is working uh, just for, for itself, um, the, the technical experts on, on their own and, uh, and the political um, side and legislators and regulators on, on the other side. Um, we benefit and i think you would benefit a lot from uh, getting first of course the, the political um, blessing and then have a very close contact of the technicality and the political um, side and this will facilitate everything um, you may know that um, at the end we have um, three types of network codes at the, at the european level uh, one concerns the, the market uh, rules, in particular with the capacity allocation and congestion management code, CSCM, as we call it. Um, this is the flagship, um, as, we, as we see it, uh, enshrining really the, the market couplings or the most efficient um, trading um, between uh, across borders, um, harmonizing rules for intraday, day ahead. Uh, second important market code was then the, the balancing um, uh, network code, um, also like the CSCM, leading to, to tremendous uh, uh, cost uh, system efficiencies and cost uh, reductions, creating a European balancing uh, market. And then uh, a third group was the forward uh, capacity allocation uh, code, uh, looking at this other time dimension besides uh, um, intraday markets and, and um, day ahead markets. A second group um, equally important is the is the system um, operation uh, codes with the system operation code it, uh, itself hugely important <clears throat> here to to have a harmonized operation of the system by the TSOs um, keeping the system open to market transactions on the one hand but of course keeping safety uh, margins uh, and what we find particularly important is some sort of regionalization of system uh, operation, which we started to do with the system operation uh, code and which 
which led now to the creation of regional coordination um, centers, which I think are very beneficial, for example, on, on joint capacity calculation. On system operations and then emergency and restoration network code, um, also very uh, important. And in future, we should have a cybersecurity network code. Um, and then the third group of network codes are the connection codes to harmonize uh, uh, really the, the interaction between the various actors with the system and the, and the TSO, starting with the generators going to, to demand and then also the specific case of the high voltage direct current um, connections. Voila, that's in a, in a nutshell uh, how the structure of network codes in Europe uh, looks, looks like, so with the market codes, system operation codes connection um, uh, codes, all this um, is now part of the core um, electricity market regulation in, in the European uh, market. Um, with all the benefits I, I talked about, I, I, I really love talking about these, uh, these benefits because they are, they are real. We have done a lot of work. This could be a blueprint um, for you. We, I, I think we have a lot of expertise. We are very happy to, to share because for us, it would be um, super important if you went into the direction of, of integration and then also connecting with, with us with all the business opportunities for, for green molecules, uh, uh, the, then of course the, the gas um, uh, side, um, the more trade and transactions we, we have, the better for our citizens, the better for our economy overall, and, and we are really here to, to help. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Magora. Thank you very much for highlighting the need that technicians and uh, politicians have to go hand in hand. And that's uh, our objective to get the institutional consensus for uh, promoting the integration of the power systems in the Mediterranean. Um, I, I will lead the floor now to uh, Hervé Lafaye, uh, who is uh, president of NSOE, uh, one of the vice presidents of MET TSO. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Florian, for, for this uh, very interesting introductory speech. Uh, and so thank you to the organizers for inviting me to, to give this uh, second speech, which uh, I will uh, hope will introduce a very stimulating uh, webinar. Um, I will, uh, first of all, uh, I will try to give you some personal thoughts about uh, what will be the role of the TSO uh, in, in, in the evolving role of the TSO in this, um, in this uh, transition and uh, perhaps try to focus on interconnection in, in, this, in this role. And let's start with the basics. Uh, the basics is why are we talking on, on transmission? It's because uh, interconnecting countries often mean crossing natural barriers such as mountains, seas, distance in general. And this is why transmission voltage levels are, are concerned and not the other levels of the, of the electricity system. So it belongs, among others, to the TSOs as system operators to detect and assess the added value in the development of these interconnections through cost-benefit analysis processes with full transparency on data and assumptions. And this assessment has to consider not only the economic value in terms of social welfare, but also other criteria, such as, of course, the security of the interconnected operation and every societal impact as well. So expanding the infrastructure in remote and often protected areas gives as well to TSO a key role in the sustainable development of territories and communities in general. Today, the unprecedented system transition that we are only beginning to enter is expected to significantly increase the added value of interconnections. This will require in conjunction with national needs for connecting the new sites of generation storage facilities, tremendous level of investments in the, infra in the infrastructure. And these investments will require efficient and consistent network planning with a key role for system operators, thanks to their independence, which brings transparency, network access, and investment decisions, as well as avoiding conflicting of interest. 
TSO not only help opti optimizing the functioning of the national grid and regional grids and the challenging dynamics, they will have the task to coordinate as far as possible stakeholders' views around shared future scenarios. And the planning process is growing more and more holistic and complex, not only in the geographical dimension, but with a more and more significant link to other sectors of the energy. There's a lot uh, of, uh, of, um, lot of, um, of um, communication on hydrogen, for instance. This link is not new. We have always taken into account power to gas, gas to power, but uh, the nature is changing with the more physically connected uh, processes, which calls for uh, the development of a full picture through a, as precise as, precise, as, as possible modeling. Of course, uh, TSOs have also a crucial role in maintenance and operation, as it will be critical to reduce outage times and to enable effective access to the, to the network. And with the multiplication of small-scale generation embedded in distribution networks, there is a rising need for greater levels of coordination and planning between TSOs and DSOs, distribution system operators. On this vertical axis, this relationship will also be deeply impacted as more and more flexibility assets will be connected to lower voltage level. However, I believe that due to what I said in the beginning about the natural level of interconnection between countries, the main perimeter of this interaction between TSOs and DSOs will remain domestic. I have been speaking so far about the added value of interconnections. The following issue is how is this added value shared among the different actors and what is the role of TSOs in this? Which relies on a new layer, the interface to give access to the users to the develop and infrastructure and services. Platforms sharing data transparently will be one of the conditions for fair competition. The efficient operation of electric system will be supported by the management of billions, trillions of data points as a part of a widely integrated system of systems. With this higher um, coming share of renewable energy generation in the electricity system, the need for flexibility, as I said, increases, and the need for innovative products and services. TSOs will play a greater role in such service offers by developing themselves new services for market actors and supporting the development of new users for networks and co-build innovative solutions with other industry players and their peers also. One growing issue would then be to protect this layer and underlying infrastructure from cyber attacks, hence the development of uh, private optic fiber infrastructure, including cross-border links often operated by the TSOs, this infrastructure being more and more interconnected and cooperated. And uh, I can uh, precise that um, one of the new network codes also is, is about these cyber security issues we, which are of growing importance. The energy transition means higher costs in general for the system operators as well, which means financing issues and within the development of associated skills. Thus, in the coming stage of the energy transition, the characteristics of the energy system will require wider responsibility for electricity system operators. At this stage, TSOs, in addition to the effective operation of the high um, voltage networks and balancing electricity generation and demand in real time, will increasingly focus on the design and administration of network codes. Given this enhanced responsibility, the uh, system operators have to prove full independence to avoid conflict of interest. They often have a national scope and are organized in different governance models. Whatever the governance model, from vertical integrated uh, to uh, independent system operators of the involved TSOs, they have to work together in full transparency. The professional associations, such as MEPSO and uh, NSOE, of course, are in the context enabled to facilitate the dialogues between TSOs, but also to share 
the input in planning, maintenance, and operation, and to save time and money through joint studies and projects. The road to transmi from transmission assets management to system of systems of operation comes with the addition of layers to the traditional asset management operation one. The, they become operator of a digital layer with real-time access for customers and stakeholders to data and information, operator of the associated infrastructure of servers and optic fiber assets, operators of the network codes to ensure transparency and non-discrimination, operators of the stakeholders' consultations about future energy scenarios, and in order to successfully uh, travel to the desired target, uh, and given the enormous economic savings at, at stake, of course, the sooner is the better to grab the first benefits, which means that the pragmatic and stepwise uh, approach is probably preferable. Of course, the Mediterranean system can learn, as Florian said, from uh, the experience of the Northern Bank, bank system. But remember that it was progressively built in the last 25 years, if you, if you start from the beginning, to the degree of sophistication it has now. So, of course, uh, accelerating the catching up could benefit from this experience, but uh, I, I think it has, it has to be really step by step. In all this, what is finally at stake and the key to success I'm sorry to be a little bit philosophical, but uh, it's to build up and maintain trust. Trust between the system operators, between the system operators and the stakeholders, trust with the regulators and authorities, and the network codes are one of the instruments to ensure that this trust, that they, they are only a support, because how do you build up trust? It's very fair and simple. It's by implementing or by keeping the promises you have made. And I, will, I, have, uh, I hope I've kept mine to be under 10 minutes. Thank you for listening and have a good day. Thank you very much, Hervé. Thank you very much. Uh, also highlighting the role of trust that's uh, not secondary in the operation of power systems. Uh, now we are entering into the, uh, uh, the, 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 the core of this workshop. I would like to leave the floor to Simone Biondi, who is moderating the first panel of uh, the, uh, this webinar. Simone is the project manager of the TCMED. We are uh, developing, supported by the European Commission. Simone, the floor is yours. I want also to thanks from my side the uh, the introduction to this workshop uh, to, from uh, from Florian Ermacora and uh, Hervé Lafaye. Uh, now in, in the first panel we uh, uh, we we had decided to to invite and uh, we we I think we, we succeed to to put together uh, the distinguished speaker from from different uh, region uh, from different uh, experience uh, each we, with uh, each specificity. Uh, the title of the first panel is uh, how to achieve a common technical and regulatory framework uh, in the MENA region. Um, at the end of the first panel, uh, we will have uh, a, a short Q&A session. So I want to invite uh, all the participants and attendees to use the uh, Q&A button features in uh, uh, the application uh, to ask their question. Uh, probably, most probably, we will not be able to, to respond all of them, but uh, uh, we will uh, uh, keep uh, and, and try to address. There could be uh, it's very important to collect uh, all your inputs. Um, one last information about the, the panel. We are not following exactly the order uh, you have found in the agenda because uh, Andre Esterman uh, um, is uh, busy in, in another parallel event. So I will now leave the floor to uh, Stefan Diwa, 
uh, apologize for my pronunciation uh, if it's not correct, who is executive director of South African Power Pool. Thank you, Simone. I'm trying to see how I can share. Okay, here we go. All right. I hope you can see it. Let me put it into. Okay. Not yet, but probably. Yeah, he's loading now. Yeah. I can see Stefan. Uh, yeah, if you can put in presentation mode, that's great. I mean, Stefan, I, I, I've seen you have collected a, a very long experience uh, in developing uh, in, in Africa, in many different. Uh, 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 country. Uh, so I leave the floor. Um, you have, uh, as you know, uh, eight, uh, eight minutes uh, and then maybe some extra minutes for a question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, and thank you for this opportunity to participate in this important uh, webinar. Uh, what I will do is just to share the experiences that SAP has gone through and uh, hopefully we can look at how that can benefit um, your region. So to start off with just a background of uh, the Southern African Power Pool, which was established in 1995 uh, through the signing of in, an intergovernmental memorandum of understanding upon uh, by the ministers responsible for energy in the Southern African development community. And the objective was to coordinate the planning and operation of the electricity business in SADC, facilitate cross-border electricity trading, promote regional cooperation in power projects development, that is generation and transmission projects, and ensure that the region attracts investments for large energy intensive users. And this covers 12 mainland member states of uh, SADC, uh, which represents a population of close to 350 million people and uh, capacity in, ex in excess of 70 gigawatts. That map shows you the countries that are covered by the Southern African Power Pool. Just a glance at the governance documents that were then established to uh, get SAP going. Uh, I've mentioned the Intergovernmental Memorandum of Understanding, which uh, established the SAP itself. The member utilities were then asked to sign an inter-utility memorandum of understanding, which then uh, provided for the management of uh, uh, SAP. The agreement between operating members was signed by those member utilities that were interconnected. And this set out the requirements for interconnected operations. While the operating guidelines then expanded the real requirements for operating the system in a safe and reliable manner. The market guidelines and market rules govern the operations of electricity trading. And um, I'm glad uh, there was a discussion on network codes. We're actually now working on a regional grid code. And this is being coordinated by the Regional Energy Regulators Association of Southern Africa, RERA. Um, on the diagram there, I'm just showing the uh, representation of uh, SAP and how it actually reports to the SADAC Secretariat and the various technical subcommittees that enable it to deliver on its uh, mandate. We have noted that the rationale for power trading in the region has been hinged on three critical building blocks. And these are the fact that we have diverse generation mix in the region. We have strong transmission interconnection and we have utilities with excess generation as well as some with a deficit that then creates opportunity for trading. Over and above this, there's good political support through the SADC and there's regulatory support from the Regional Energy Regulators Association. I'm showing you there the interconnection between the 12 countries with an indication that three of them are not yet interconnected. That is Angola, Malawi, and Tanzania. 
in the blocks, I've also shown you the utilities in each of these member countries that are members of SAPP. We are on a drive to get more membership from independent uh, power producers at the moment. Some of the key issues to trading that we've noted are that the power pool governance and operational rules have to be in place and agreed to. There should be clear transmission capacity allocation and pricing. There should be efficient handling of energy imbalances. There should be good handling of outages and system emergency situations. And above all, we need solid market rules. Just to give you an overview of how the submarket has developed over the years, uh, with that graph showing you how the volumes actually increased from 2009 to, to 2020. And um, I've also tried to show some of the main drivers to the high increase in volumes from one year to the next. And these were based on interventions from SAP after noticing some challenges some challenges that have been faced along the way. So bilateral trading has always been in place, uh, even before SAP was established, and it continues to be dominating the transactions that take place in the region. However, in 2001, there was a need for shorter term trading, and hence the short term energy market was launched. In 2002, an additional post term or a kind of a balancing market was introduced. The short-term energy market itself then evolved into the day ahead market, which was launched in 2009. And in 2013, a post day ahead market was introduced to act as a kind of a balancing market. An intraday market, which happens on the day was introduced in 2016 to replace the post uh, day ahead market. In the same year in 2016, two physical forward markets were also introduced. That is the month ahead and the week ahead. So currently these are the portfolios that we are trading. We will be launching the balancing market from the 1st of April this year. And we believe it will also help improve the efficiency of the market. And um, the conditions that we have set for anyone to be able to trade on the market include having been licensed or given permission by the host country to undertake cross-border trading. And this is the role that is provided by the national regulators. Having been accepted as a market participant by the SAP executive committee, being party to a transmission system operator connected to a sub control area and have arrangements for balance responsibility. Signing the sub market governance documents, opening the requisite accounts for trading purposes and providing required security for trading purposes. And of course they should have at least uh, two trained and certified traders and any party including independent entities that will satisfy these conditions would therefore be allowed to trade in the market. I think with that, uh, those will be the things I thought I should just share with this webinar. Thank you very much. Stephen, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, I mean, extremely uh, interesting. Um, I, I would like to, to ask you, uh, I mean, very shortly, a couple, couple of, uh, of questions. So uh, it first, it, it seems that the first uh, starting point was an intergovernative uh, uh, agreement, uh, memorandum of understanding. I mean, does this uh, uh, memorandum of, of, of understanding uh, and the intergovernative act uh, prescribe uh, uh, um, the, the organization of the different uh, 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 market and reform in the different countries or only limit to uh, the uh, tra trans uh, to, to, to the uh, to the trading between countries I mean uh, this is the first question and probably related to that also uh, 
we have he heard uh, before uh, uh, from Florian Ermacora that uh, uh, in European experience, uh, the unbundling uh, was an important step that uh, uh, ensure a, a, a development or a better functioning of the market. Uh, what about unbundling in uh, in your uh, in your region? Thank you, Simon, for those questions. So the intergovernmental memorandum of understanding only focused on trading across the borders. It did not uh, prescribe uh, the kind of market structures for each of those countries. Those were separate discussions shared between the uh, ministers in their various uh, meetings. So at the moment, we're only talking about wholesale trading that is taking place in the Southern African power pool. In terms of unbundling, this has um, happened at different paces in the different countries. And uh, we, we find that for some countries, they've taken a lot of steps to unbundle the market, to unbundle the power structures. Some have remained vertically integrated. We even have seen in some countries where they unbundled earlier on and they are rebundling as we move on. So for now, we're just focusing on the wholesale market. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. But I mean, this uh, does not prevent the increase uh, uh, in uh, volume of uh, energy trade as you show. So that's uh, uh, very interesting. Um, uh, what, uh, I, I, there is one question, but I will keep for late because I don't want to run out of time because uh, uh, yeah, we have a very busy, busy agenda. So um, thank you. Thank you, Stefan. I hope you can stay with us uh, for the rest of the morning. I will now leave the floor uh, and again apologize for my uh, wrong pronunciation, most probably to Moyed Al- Kadem from GCCA, moving uh, not 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 from far away to, uh, uh, from from South Africa to uh, Gulf uh, uh, countries. So uh, please, the floor floor is yours. Uh, th thank you, Simon. Uh, uh, you pronounce it right. Uh, it's Moyad Al Kadem. Uh, I'm working for the GCC Interconnection Authority uh, in the system planning. Uh, I would start off with uh, uh, some idea about the, uh, uh, the energy sector, what we have in the GCC. Uh, our, my, my presentation mainly focuses on GCC, but there are some aspects also applicable for the, even for the MENA region, whom we have also, uh, at least some of them, we have uh, good relations. Uh, so for the GCC, uh, it, is, it is interconnected since 2012 uh, by the GCCIA, the GCC Interconnection Authority. So almost 13 years now. Uh, uh, it's mainly through uh, 400 kV, uh, except with uh, Saudi Arabia, it is back to back at GDC because of the frequency difference. Uh, the, the, the energy sector in, in the GCC is, uh, at the moment, is going uh, through uh, reforms in all countries. Uh, there is no exception. Uh, the, the, the peak demand as of today, it's about 120 gigawatts. So it's quite quite big system. Um, and most of the generation today, what we have is uh, mainly depending on fossil fuels. Uh, there are projects uh, about one, 1. 1.5 or let's say more than one gigawatt of renewables, and there are a couple of a uh, couple of thousands of, mega, of gigawatts, sorry, of megawatts uh, for renewables under construction. Uh, so this is uh, well, just. Yeah, sorry, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we are still seeing the the, the first. Uh, uh, the first slide uh, and not in presentation mode. Uh, do you see it now? Uh, okay, yeah, okay. now now perfect. Thank okay, you. sorry. So this is the this, this was the first slide. So I, I will just skip it. Uh, 
this is just an idea about the renewable plants, what we have in the GCC. Uh, this, is, this is a plan from a couple of years ago. There are a few changes, but the major change is in Saudi Arabia, where uh, the plan by 2030 was 25. Now it's almost all around 60 gigawatt. So it's quite uh, ambitious plants. Uh, uh, and most of these plants are actually uh, sponsored uh, and directed, I would say, by the government, the ministries, uh, the respected ministries uh, in each country. Uh, and they are fully aware that doing this alone without inter new interconnections, without trading, this definitely will not work. Uh, as, as, as they wish to, to, to work. Uh, they will have a lot of curtailment. Uh, they will not be able to utilize the renewables as, as they should. Uh, and because of this, there are actually uh, some of the governments, they are being, uh, they are initiating from their side uh, for new interconnections. Uh, so everyone is, is fully aware that uh, trading uh, should happen soon, uh, not in the long term. For the GCC uh, interconnection, uh, we do have trading. Uh, as I said, we started, uh, it was almost at the end of 2009, uh, but we didn't have quite much of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, trading. Uh, there are reasons, I will come to them. Uh, it picked up, uh, let's say, in 2016. It's still not up to the expectation, I would say, uh, given the system is more than one, one more than one gigawatt of uh, demand. It's uh, this is not up to expectation, of course. But we are, uh, let's say, we are in a stage now we, where we can um, uh, have uh, real time uh, transactions, unlike what we had before. So we we have done uh, a lot of improvement recently. Uh, until let's say uh, ten years ago, most of the. Uh, uh, Utilities in the GCC were uh, fully regulated, I would say. Uh, it started around 10 years ago to deregulate uh, the energy sector. Um, the majority, has, uh, the, 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 the model they are using in the GCC countries, it's mainly single buyer model. I think uh, for, uh, for a starting point, uh, this is the easiest way to do it. Um, one of, one of the things that is, uh, uh, let's say, being an obstacle for the, uh, for the energy trade, I would say, is the energy subsidy uh, along, the, uh, along the complete energy sector, not only electricity, obviously. It's oil, gas, and electricity. And because of this, uh, it, it makes it a little bit difficult to, to, to trade energy. Uh, because of the fact that uh, changing changing the policies internally, it's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, there are many parties involved. It's not the, just the decision of the uh, the electricity, let's say, regu the internal electricity regulator. It's uh, by far more complicated than than it than it looks. Uh, and even the trading, what we had so far in the GCC. Uh, it's mainly in the long term uh, transactions rather than the let's say day ahead transaction uh, for the recent uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, and knowing that uh, most of the uh, uh, most of the trading, I, I, that's my impression in, in the in the in Europe or the developed uh, markets, they demand a lot of uh, on the short uh, short term of the trading. And this is the reason why it's not, let's say, uh, up to the expectation. But we are in the we are at the level where we can uh, now start the short short term uh, transactions. But as I said, there are obstacles, and one of them is the subsidy. Now, now, now the subsidy, uh, the uh, the countries they have actually started, uh, at least the GCC, they started removing the subsidy, but it will not be in one shot. Obviously, uh, otherwise it, it may create uh, many economical uh, problems internally. Uh, so it started gradually, but it seems that it is uh, it will take a couple of years more uh, 
it will not happen in, in one year. That's, that's for sure. Uh, now, these are uh, uh, one of some of the, let's say, gaps or challenges what we have in the, either in the GCC and uh, or the MENA region. Uh, they, there is a gap between the uh, internal uh, regulation and uh, uh, let's say uh, regional regulation. So at, at the moment, there is no regional regulation, of course, but uh, because of the fact that each country, they have their own regulations, uh, there is no alignment between them. It's, it's, it is becoming difficult to, 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 create, uh, to create a market, even, even if, if it is bilateral, it's not that easy. And uh, because of this, uh, 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 there is a need to create uh, a regional regulator. Uh, I should say for the GCC uh, that uh, we have a regulator, but it is only concerned with the GCC countries. It's not concerned with the others. Uh, so for, for that aspect for the GCC we have, but not across other countries. Uh, the other point is uh, the regional uh, op uh, operators, system operators. Today, there are a lot of uh, interconnections actually between the countries. Uh, but unfortunately, there is no regional system operator aside from G the GCCIA, of course. Uh, but again, that is only for the GCC. So there is a lack of uh, uh, operators. Of course, you cannot just create an operators if there is no uh, viable financial, uh, let's say, model uh, for, the, for the operation. So this is interlinked with the, with the let's say, the model of the interconnections uh, that put in place already. Uh, the other issue is, and um, maybe this is related to the subsidy, uh, there is, uh, I would say, no, there is no transparent uh, uh, energy market. Uh, some of the prices are not known in, in, in certain countries. Uh, and this makes it uh, even difficult even for, uh, to make a transaction. Uh, the, the next point is that even though that the, there have been internal uh, changes uh, to do the deregulate the internal uh, energy sectors in the countries, still uh, there was not that much attention to the opportunities that they can gain from trading with the, with the uh, other, uh, let's say, uh, other parties. That could be for different reasons. Uh, I will speak for the GCC. One example is that. Uh, between 2010 and 2015, there was a dramatic, uh, let's say, uh, or aggressive increase in the demand. Uh, in some cases, it is reaching 10%. Uh, so it, it wasn't easy to, to, uh, to, to look for the external uh, cross-border opportunities. Uh, but now, as I said uh, previously, a couple of minutes ago, that uh, the governments now, they are, they are initiating from their side for interconnections. Uh, one of the things uh, mentioned in the keynotes in the beginning uh, about speaking to, to, uh, to the political uh, people, uh, and that's right, we have seen it uh, recently from our side as GCCIA. Uh, there could be some, some gap or uh, just because there was no experience in, in setting frameworks uh, for, the, for the interconnections and for the, uh, for the market. Uh, it, 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 they may they may find it a little bit difficult uh, to address it uh, just because there was no uh, experience. One example from the technical aspect is how to address the security of the supply, and that is uh, uh, one, once once someone could put it uh, or regulate it uh, for the interconnection, it can work. And and, and GCCIA we have a good example for it. So uh, speaking with the decision makers is, is very important. Uh, for them, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy to change their plans uh, because they, they need to understand that once you do this, this interconnection and you make a trading, you can change your plans, you can save money. Uh, and uh, more mainly interconnections, they are always, I would say always, a uh, win-win situation. And this is, uh, let's say, one of the missing uh, 
aspect of, of the interconnections and trading. Uh, that is the end of uh, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I, I, I start uh, since we are running out of time uh, to, to, to if you can disconnect your presentation uh, and uh, I will ask it to the ne next panelist is Jasmina truly to start to share her screen. But I have one question uh, uh, from, from you still, please. Uh, the question is the following. Don't, probably you can directly read, but I, I read for, for all uh, the, the, the attendees. So don't you think that it would be possible to have an efficient market thinking only about the energy cost and not the price and then avoid the impact of subsidies? Okay, uh, I will answer it and I hope I understand the question. Uh, in a way, I think it, is, it, is, uh, it might be efficient, but uh, again, the subsidy, even though there is a subsidy, each country, they have different level of subsidy. So the electricity, of, the electricity uh, uh, or the energy production in one country is not the same as uh, the other country. Even if you bring, if you take the same unit with the same heat rate, uh, with the same conditions, uh, the, the production will not be the same because the subsidy level is not similar. It's not the same, let's say. It may, it may be close, but not, it's not exactly the same. I, I hope I understand. Thank, thank you. I, I, I mean, we are speaking about complex uh, uh, issues, so I, I appreciate the fact that you you try to, to, to respect the way, the, the, uh, the time and uh, will be very interesting, I think, to uh, but this workshop is not just, uh, uh, I mean, a spot workshop, but I mean, uh, most of this uh, point uh, we will have time to discuss uh, uh, and dig into the details. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Boyan. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Jasmina, truly, to, to, to share the screen. Uh, Jasmina is uh, head of uh, electricity unit at the uh, Energy Community Secretariat. Uh, I leave the floor to you. Thank you, Simone. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yes, we can hear you well and we see the slide. Great, so. thank you. Uh, so um, uh, my presentation today will be on uh, how actually uh, we are in the energy community uh, achieving this goal of common energy market and uh, having in mind that the topic is challenging uh, to be presented in eight minutes, please do not hesitate to speed me up if needed, but uh, still I would uh, like uh, firstly to thank uh, to the organizers for inviting the energy community uh, secretariat uh, uh, from Vienna. Uh, to uh, join this very interesting uh, workshop and to actually allow us to step out of our region and to exchange with uh, colleagues from other regions where I see also a lot of things are uh, going on. Uh, I will try not to repeat uh, what was uh, already said uh, in the introductory speeches, uh, but um, as um, uh, Angelo um, mentioned in the beginning, in the opening, uh, uh, I'm today presenting Actually, can you see my next slide? No, we are still seeing the, the, the first uh, one. Now? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm, okay, great. I'm uh, today presenting uh, uh, those um, group of countries who are not uh, EU member states, so non-EU countries, which actually took a, a legally binding way to implement the common uh, energy market. And uh, uh, we started this journey in 2005 uh, when the treaty uh, on the establishment of the energy community was signed. Uh, this treaty is legally binding uh, for all the contracting parties. Today we have nine of them, uh, six Western Balkan uh, countries and the uh, Black Sea region countries, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. On the other uh, side of the treaty is European Union. And um, uh, this treaty is uh, binding. And also we have uh, uh, some enforcement mechanisms which are quite weak. Uh, but on the other hand, we rely more on the strong cooperation between our countries and uh, 
uh, also, as it was already mentioned, on the uh, mutual understanding and the trust. And um, uh, so far, um, uh, so um, by our countries uh, gathered around the energy community, the goals are, as I can see from the other regions, uh, more or less the same. Uh, to develop cross-border trade, to increase competition because markets were small, and to attract the new investment. Also, one uh, of the goals at that time was to improve the environmental situation. And this goal is actually nowadays becoming uh, the main uh, overarching objective of all our activities. And um, uh, we also have a very strong uh, institutional setting. Uh, we have ministerial council, then regulatory board, as we could see also from other colleagues, it's very important to have all these, these institutions, permanent high level group, and also our yearly forums. Uh, what is also not to be undermined is the role of the energy community secretariat as a facilitator of the process, as, as a body that uh, supports implementation of a case, monitors, reports, and uh, facilitates uh, this regional cooperation. Uh, how we are doing uh, actually uh, this um, process of market integration is by the rule of law. Uh, in a nutshell, what we are doing, we are importing EU legislation into our countries. We, so we take uh, EU uh, um, acquis, we adapt them for our region, because as also we could hear in the beginning, there is no one fits all solution. So always some adaptations are needed. Uh, we adapt for our region and then uh, our ministerial council adopts this. So this procedure is pretty straightforward. And where we stand at the moment is that we have a third energy package uh, applied in our countries still, but just recently we um, actually got a new package uh, just before a new year, as a new year's present, uh, uh, we got the first part of clean energy package, which includes electricity directive, risk preparedness regulation, renewable energy efficiency and governance. And what is planned for the end of this year is actually part of the package, which is most important for this, what we are discussing now for the uh, cross-border cooperation and integration. And this is electricity regulation and also 2030 targets, which are becoming the main driver of the whole process. And also what is missing in our uh, legal framework is what was uh, uh, elaborated uh, uh, by Florian, and this is network codes and guidelines on market and on the system operation. And we hope to have uh, the full package uh, adopted for our region by the end of this year. And this will be the, the really major uh, game changer in this process. Uh, so uh, as you could see, uh, this adoption of the legal framework is pretty straightforward. But when we come to the implementation, then it's not so straightforward. And uh, in all these uh, last uh, 15, 16 years, we, uh, we had many um, you know, like uh, challenges and the uh, obstacles to, to overcome in this process of implementing EU acquis in our region. Uh, those were, mm, in the first place, some political, institutional, regulatory, legal. Uh, then uh, also we had to take into account specificities of uh, market structure in every country. So I cannot, uh, of course, in this limited time, go through all of them. They are just here listed for those who will later see the presentation. But I would like now just to focus on a couple of main maybe messages that I would like to um, send across and also in a way to answer the questions that you ask as an objective of this workshop to see how to get there and uh, uh, is the legally binding framework required for attracting investments and uh, at which stage of development of interconnection grids. So I will, I will try shortly to somehow um, re respond to these questions. Uh, but before that, just to show what in practice, um, uh, how our energy markets look in practice. So we have six Western Balkan, uh, six countries there in the, let's say in the, in the middle of um, the continent and uh, very well interconnected also with the European uh, Union member states. Uh, then we have Ukraine and Moldova as a second region. And we have also Georgia, uh, who is um, actually not uh, interconnected with any of the contracting parties. Uh, 
So this is our region. And just to show how actually uh, tiny it is when you compare with the whole uh, energy market of European Union. So the, the whole Western Balkans is, is, is only about 2.5% uh, percent of EU consumption. Uh, and in this, uh, I will focus maybe more on Western Balkans because I think this was maybe um, um, at the moment uh, uh, more relevant for this discussion. And um, also what we have, uh, we have different circumstances in, in different regions. So despite the fact that we all have the same legal framework, we still uh, need some um, customized solution for the countries because Western Balkan 6 uh, is uh, highly interconnected. They are operating within ENSOE. Most of them are members of the ENSOE and um, uh, they already had, uh, even before signing the, the framework, they had some uh, common rules under the ENSOE umbrella. Uh, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, they are not synchronized to the EU, and they have a different uh, regime so far. Um, so um, this is, uh, of course, cross-border interconnections, our main prerequisite for market integration. And this graph that I here presented, I wanted just to show uh, that uh, we really have a huge transmission capacities on interconnections. And they are really uh, participating in a high share in the installed generation. But this is not enough. So this is just a prerequisite. Uh, but the uh, actually, the main point is uh, to which extent these uh, capacities are utilized. And uh, for that, what we were uh, also heard in the beginning, this is just the soft uh, hardware. But we need also uh, this hardware to be surrounded by software. And this software is actually functional electricity market. And the uh, uh, utilization of interconnection capacities is directly linked to the level of market development. And um, knowing that uh, throughout all these years, we were uh, working a lot to uh, actually move from this starting point where we had many small fragmented regulated markets with the dominant uh, state-owned incumbent companies. Uh, so we were working on this TSO and DSO unbundling and price deregulation, uh, which is really crucial step in, in uh, making the markets competitive and open and having a level playing field. Uh, we are almost um, there with this process, so it's almost completed. Uh, but on the market development side, we were also having activities on all time frames, starting from the forward capacity allocation, uh, where the biggest achievements were made so far. And then uh, moving to the short uh, term markets, they had intraday balancing market. And uh, so far we had uh, very limited uh, progress on, on this front. And um, as you can uh, see also, this reflects on the usage of interconnection capacities uh, because their usage is very uh, modest and it's only between 20 and 50% in most of the countries. And um, uh, actually, the, this is uh, also the consequence of a couple of uh, issues. Uh, first of all, that we uh, also, we, we did a lot of work on the wholesale market uh, deregulation, uh, but what is here actually very important message to be sent is that the wholesale market development has to go hand in hand with retail market development. Uh, so prices also at the retail have to be uh, deregulated and, uh, uh, and market-based. Because when you talk to the potential investors, because we all want to bring new investments, and when we talk to them, they always say, what is the main precondition? They say price, price, and price. So this is what is driving their interest, you know, to come to some country. And we also still have, um, uh, let's say, uh, much lower prices than in EU and also uh, high um, uh, uh, market concentration. Uh, but what we learned from European Union is that uh, actually the best way to overcome uh, these uh, challenges of having a, a very limited competition and um, uh, uh, let's say underutilized interconnections, the main actually driver is process of market coupling. So how, uh, TSOs will calculate uh, these interconnection capacities and how they will be allocated. 
And uh, this is actually where we are now putting the most of our, um, let's say, efforts to bring uh, actually the legal framework in place. Because at the moment we have um, a gap between EU uh, member states uh, legal framework and legal framework in our countries. And due to this gap, uh, at the moment, uh, market coupling is still not uh, uh, possible uh, because EU has a very strict uh, legal framework. And if we want to couple with them, we have to ensure that uh, uh, these frameworks are compatible and, the, and the also um, uh, legally binding for both our countries and EU member states. And this is exactly what we are now um, uh, trying to overcome by the adoption of network codes and guidelines for the energy community. Uh, these are pivotal documents for, for the market integration. And we hope that if we adopt them end of this year, that we will ensure this uh, legal framework. So as you can see uh, in our region, uh, everything actually uh, has to be somehow legally supported. So voluntary approaches don't really work in practice. Uh, but uh, while we were all these years um, uh, mostly occupied with how to actually utilize interconnection capacities, uh, energy transition um, process started. And um, uh, what is now becoming more important that's not maybe more important. Just mean I just uh, I, I want to ask you to to try yeah. to, to, to uh, I mean it, I it's really a shame because it's extremely interesting. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I, I, <laughs> I mean, that's my but role. What today. is becoming really a focus is not only transmission capacities, but also a, a generation mix. But here also just to to pass uh, another very important uh, message by which I would like actually to. Uh, finalized my presentation is that uh, in the first uh, uh, part, what I mentioned was very important that uh, the development of interconnection capacities is followed by the development of the market. But for the energy transition uh, to be done in a cost effective way, we really have to ensure that also, you know, like all market elements are there, short term markets, market integration, everything that will unlock uh, uh, penetration of renewable energy sources and actually um, uh, uh, their, their proper integration into the system so that system can uh, remain uh, secure. And for that, uh, we will not be able to, to complete this process without market integration. So this is why this uh, conference and your topic is very important. But there are many more uh, uh, carbon pricing is actually becoming our main uh, now uh, focus because we need the level playing field, but maybe for, through your questions or some questions of the audience. Yeah, Jasmina, I, I, I mean, it's extremely, I mean, uh, again, I think we, we really, uh, uh, having you and having the different experience, uh, it's probably uh, very inspiring and, and useful. Um, I mean, I, uh, maybe moving to the next presentation as I, we have done before. So I ask you to disconnect the presentation and I ask uh, Yaya Brabati to, to start to present, to share his screen. Uh, well, I, I actually have one, one question. I mean, since we, we uh, met, so we have other region, not member of, uh, speaking about Morocco, Algeria and Tunisia, uh, not synchronous, but but not uh, um, uh, synchronous with Europe, uh, but not represented on your map. But uh, 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 questions uh, uh, that probably will not be possible to answer in in a short minute is, uh, uh, I mean, how to uh, do you think your experience could be beneficial for also uh, other country or energy communities only limited to a certain specific region? Uh, yeah, what you can tell us about that? You would uh, like uh, me to answer now? Yes. If, uh, uh, yeah, uh, of you... course, our experience can be extremely um, uh, useful uh, to all uh, other countries. Um, I just before uh, Corona started, I was uh, I ha had the chance to uh, to go to Riyadh and to discuss with colleagues from GCC. But all these topics in eight minutes we discussed for eight hours. 
And um, it, I, I believe and I had um, an impression that it was extremely useful for them. And in particular, this what I did not man, uh, have time to mention, uh, this actually problem of uh, level playing field and uh, uh, if you have uh, coal subsidies in one country and uh, not in other countries, and if you have carbon pricing in one country and not uh, carbon pricing in the other country, uh, how then you can integrate actually. And um, this is very important question because all these uh, uh, market distortions actually leave uh, to the, uh, let's say, um, non-level playing field and uh, um, a distortion of the competition in the market. And this is exactly what we are now seeing in Europe uh, uh, with the carbon leakage. And uh, now this proposal for carbon border adjustment mechanism to protect uh, European countries from carbon leakage. And this is something that uh, all uh, countries, uh, uh, not only from energy community, but all countries uh, neighboring also uh, European Union, uh, such as Morocco, will have to look into that. And um, I believe that um, there are many things that we can exchange and learn from each other. Thank you. F f thanks to you, and uh, I mean, indeed, I think that having eight hours uh, will be <laughs> uh, for the next time we 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 learn a bit. Uh, uh, probably more time is necessary, but again, this is uh, just the first opportunity and uh, to to get in contact and uh, to exchange first thoughts. Uh, thanks again, Jasmina. And uh, well, you were mentioning uh, uh, Morocco, so now it's uh, perfect in the agenda. I leave the floor to Yaya uh, Brabati, representing uh, uh, Medreg, uh, but also uh, Morocco uh, uh, National Regulatory Agency. So Yaya, I leave you the floor. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Can see this. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well and uh, we can see uh, the screen. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, it's with deep honor that I stand here today to take part in, uh, in uh, uh, to take part uh, to this event, which everyone is here is motivated and well aware for this great opportunity. Since the team, since the team of this panel uh, is about MENA countries, I want to start my presentation with a number. Excuse me, the, the slides doesn't turn on. It's moving, no? No, we are stuck on the first. Okay, okay. now, okay. now um, I see panel one. So, okay, so. Okay. So, so since the team of this panel is about MENA region, I want to start my presentation with a number. 18 million people uh, of MENA population still lack access to electricity. So adding to this, uh, 20 million people in the region cannot access electricity in a continuative and satisfactory way. So, and this, uh, beside the fact uh, uh, that MENA region is, not, is known not only as a leading supplier of oil and gas, but uh, uh, also blessed with all natural resources uh, necessary for a vibrant renewable energy sector. So according to the, MENA, uh, to the World Bank, MENA solar potential is considered to be enough uh, to meet all the needs of uh, uh, de uh, global demand electricity and also have significant uh, wind potential like the one of the Morocco who have the lowest prices announced for wind energy in the world with a record bids of 30 cent dollar the megawatt hour. So further changes are needed in order for MENA countries to be able to explore their full potential of renewable and position themselves as a sustainable energy uh, champion. But as you can see in this slide, MENA countries have difficulties to meet their renewable energy targets. And this is due mainly to several obstacles that need to be overcome, like weak grid infrastructure, regulatory barrier, access to finance, and most importantly, subsidy, subsidies to conventional energy. So, however, in the northern shore of the Mediterranean, there is another type of problem, like the fact that market forces have converged to create excess capacity in the sector and drive prices down. Uh, uh, and uh, as an example, you can see here in the left, uh, the appearance of negative prices, and this is due to uh, low consumption and high level 
of uh, non-flexible generation like uh, nuclear and hydro uh, that causes a generation surplus and also with high uh, penetration of rest with marginal uh, costs uh, very low and priority to dispatch. That uh, sadly requires a higher need for flexibility generation. You can see here on the right uh, that an increase of rest will uh, conduct uh, to the hour reduction of CCGT that are still needed to guarantee the correct balancing between supply and demand. So maybe talking these days about negative prices is misplaced because, as you can see here in the graph, that citizens in countries like Italy, France, and Spain uh, are now facing all-time high uh, uh, energy bills that add to the economic distress caused by the pandemic. And uh, uh, the, the plant closer, like the one, excuse me, I will, will open the screen, okay. That I can see in my presentation. And the closure of Germany last three nuclear reactor by the end of 2020 will take out four gigawatts out of the market. That will increase of the power market exposure uh, to gas prices. And we can easily see the potential of extreme uh, prices seen in 2021, passing from 15 euro the megawatt hour in February to 300 euro the megawatt hour in December. So uh, in this context of this crisis, we strongly believe that the Mediterranean is uh, the chance because this region have the assets to, uh, to take their place as a leader in the energy sector, since it presents many complementarities and opportunities uh, that should be taken in order to enhance trade investment, like weather parameter contrasted between North and South. And we have a sun time shift of two hours, 36 uh, minutes, and there is the difference in load pattern and energy mix. So for the load pattern, we can see here in the graph that uh, uh, the peak loads and the off-peak loads of Mediterranean country are spread across the year. And you can see here as an example, for example, when France, the biggest system in the area, have his off-peak loads, many countries have their uh, peak loads like Italy, Turkey, and the Maghreb country. Uh, so we can benefit from this with the sharing the peak capacity through exchanges and the interconnection. And also we should notice that uh, there is a disparity between Mediterranean country with a system uh, with a dominant component, formerly nuclear for France, gas for Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, and uh, also hydro for Albania, with for the whole power system with fairly balanced proportion. So we need more interconnection. And a good example of uh, who take profit from all these benefits is Morocco, a country at the crossroad of uh, energy exchange, thanks to its uh, geographical location and existing interconnection with Spain and Algeria, and also projects in progress like the one with Portugal and CDIO country via Mauritania. So in the next slide, we will explore in detail how to give a fresh boost to these economic ties uh, and uh, um, by giving a concrete example experienced by Morocco with the Maghreb countries and uh, the Iberian Peninsula. So let's begin with the Maghreb countries. So that you discussed in your inter introduction, the Maghreb zone, including Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, already exists and is operational. So Libya can be added to the Maghreb zone, but uh, in a condition that the interconnection between Libya and Egypt must be open. In fact, I participated in many tests that carry out with this interconnection, showing show oscillation and instability leading to the opening of the of the latter. So there is several anomaly for uh, the Maghrebian country. So first of all, this we can resume in seven points. So first of all, the number of incidents affecting Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, Algeria is very high uh, and has reached 120 uh, incidents each year, which is a lot. And there is not enough uh, uh, reserve sharing. The, the exchange between various countries uh, are limited. There is a lot of involuntary exchange that have been very high since the commissioning of this uh, uh, interconnection. Currently, the involuntary exchanges is managed by the compensation based in zero balance. But this is unfair and difficult to compensate and could generate some economic losses for, uh, uh, for one or other countries. So there's also the incompatibility of exchange capability with physical capabilities. I will give you the example of Morocco, Algeria. For example, they have a BTC of 3000 megawatts or the net transfer capacity is only 300 megawatts. So for this problem, we have concrete proposal that we should work on as a regulator and TSOs for a better use of the Maghrebian interconnection. So we, we should first create a framework for trade, an energy and exchange platform between the TSO, we should identify and remove legal and technical barriers that block energy exchanges. We should set up also a renovation system based on commercial approach. 
we should do a lot of CBA uh, uh, studies to improve trade between the Maghrebian countries and create a market for network services like ancillary uh, uh, services. So for technical problem, uh, TSO and the regulators should revise the adjustment of threshold and improve the quality of exchange, doing some uh, identifying the origin of this involuntary exchange and propose relevant uh, technical and commercial solution. Uh, we should work as a regulator to harmonize grid codes between Maghreb countries to prepare for the regional markets and sharing the reserves, especially the third one that must be at the disposal of uh, each TSO and the establishment of a procedure for capacity allocation and calculation uh, uh, like the one used in Europe. So after exposing technical and economical problems uh, seen in Morocco, uh, now I will move for the regulatory framework of cross-Mediterranean interconnector. So I will talk from my experience as a head of the projects of uh, Morocco-Portugal interconnections. Uh, when I was at the Department of Strategy and Planning at ONI, which is the, uh, the Moroccan TSO. And I think that we can apply a similar reasoning uh, of the other possible interconnection between the two shores of the, the Mediterranean, like Tunisia, Italia, or Algeria, Spain, or Algeria, Italia. So, um, uh, first of all, in general, the legal and the regulatory framework may, for example, prohibit or favor certain uh, ownership structures set requirements for access uh, to the interconnected by a third party or regulate the revenue. So first of all, European legislation uh, requires that interconnector need to comply with one of the European embedding structure. So since uh, embedding is not yet uh, a reality in Morocco as ONE operates as a vertically integrated uh, utility, the interconnector must be owned and operated by a separate legal uh, entity uh, to comp that complies with one of embedding rules of European Commission. Secondary, non-discriminatory network access needs to be provided to third parties for any transmission network infrastructure. So we talk here about explicit or implicit auctions uh, via physical transmission rights or market coupling. So hopefully for the case of Morocco, Henri, the regulator of Morocco, uh, just published in January, uh, the first grid code of Morocco that gives the right uh, to private sectors to have access to interconnection. So interconnection will be a competition between the current TSO and uh, especially the renewable who want to export energy. So uh, the congestion rent that can be generated from the difference between marginal costs between the two countries uh, must be only used to maintaining and increasing the interconnection capacity uh, through uh, additional network investment. And the idea behind this is that uh, the provision to limit the incentive of TSOs uh, to construct suboptimal interconnection capacity in order to maximize uh, the energy, uh, the congestion rent. So uh, there is a lot of business model that uh, I, I will talk from the experience of Morocco uh, for considered to, for, to the interconnection. So the first two one we can confirm that are not possible for our case because regulation in Europe context uh, uh, would typically not allow the exclusive use of an interconnector by its owner. And since there is no market in southern parts uh, of the Mediterranean, market coupling is also not option. So uh, for, from my experience, I think that uh, it's clearly the most straightforward model is the regulated one, but regulators should carefully uh, consider the overall benefit for their system, in particular, the benefit of our consumers. So I remember very well when I work with METSO, uh, we, do, we have done a lot of social and economic welfare studies that show who benefits from uh, any interconnection. So there is also a common option, which is a merchant interconnector, does not seem to be a sensible alternative because European regulation may limit the ability to conclude a long-term contract. And finally, a hybrid uh, option could theoretically be explored, for example, like the one used in Britain, a cap and flow regime as a way to alleviate the costs on tariff payers. However, such option is only practical if there's an evolution on the market mechanism in Morocco or any southern parts uh, for the Mediterranean, passing amongst other things by the publication of day ahead prices for electricity. So we can understand that there is advantages and disadvantages uh, for, of different business models as well. The ability to implement uh, them uh, are also strongly influenced by the relevant uh, requirements of the legal regulatory framework and the electricity structure and the design in respective uh, countries. So in order to evaluate this benefit uh, and the risk of different business models, 
uh, for example, for uh, Port Portugal, Morocco, interconnector, or any other cross Mediterranean interconnector, we applied the following criteria markets and regulatory compatibility, financing and financial incentive, like having the PCI uh, status, distribution of the costs, which stakeholder covering the costs, there is complexity of implementation, there is a cost recovery, and impact of economic benefits as we uh, talk uh, to, for consumers or producers. So in order to benefit from the best practices developed in the area uh, and share the problems that they have faced, in 2007, uh, Mediterranean energy reg regulators have associated themselves in, into MEDREG. So uh, who we are, we are 27 members from 22 countries. So three Balkan countries in Turkey, nine European country and nine from the MENA region. And MEDREG has been working uh, to support regulator in mitigating uh, market failure and avoid market distortion uh, through the exchange of expertise uh, and the realization of reports on various topics. So I invite you uh, to, to visit our website to download them. And we have five pillars of our strategy, a sound institutional regulatory framework, an optimal condition for infrastructure investment, and also competitive and transparent electricity and gas markets, and intensify the regional cooperation and setting up for pilot projects, and finally, efficient consumer protection, including vulnerable consumer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, Maybe yeah. I I, too, <laughs> too fast. No, I mean, thank you. I, I mean, again, our fault that we, we, we put to good, probably, I mean, we didn't have opportunity to organize a physical event. So for a full day, uh, and so for a virtual event, we have decided to compress uh, in uh, in just one morning, but uh, a, a, a lot of insights. Uh, so thank you, Yaya. I mean, many things to 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 follow up and and, and discuss in details. Um, I I now uh, pass the floor to uh, to close this first panel to uh, Andre Esterman. Uh, Andre is the convenor of Market Integration Working Group at ENSOE, uh, and is also uh, a, a, an expert uh, um, at 50 Hertz. Uh, he, he was now, uh, I mean, initially was foreseen as the first panel we moved to uh, at the end of this first panel because he was busy in a parallel event with a very similar uh, uh, let's say objective uh, uh, organized by uh, German government. So Andre, thanks uh, for managing uh, and jumping from one event to the others. Uh, I leave you uh, the floor, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for being able to participate today and jump from one meeting to the other. The virtual world is uh, unbelievable what you can do these days. Uh, and the topic seems to be rather close. I'm trying to uh, present the screen and uh, the, the presentation I provided. Um, so hopefully that can be accommodated. It's loading. Uh, yes, we can see Andre. Yeah. I'm not sure if I should present it and then it still shows. Uh, please bear with me. Uh, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Uh, yes, we can. It's not in presentation mode yet. Oh, I tried uh -huh. to do it in presentation mode. Nonetheless, I continue looking at the time yeah. That, yeah. that I got and um, the many uh, very interesting presentation that we have seen today. So um, giving the time constraints, I would be rather brief. So um, as you heard in one or other, um, uh, a couple of presentations uh, for uh, uh, European uh, energy community, for example, that, that NCE um, is uh, at the heart when it comes to the um, further harmonization of operations between TSOs uh, in continental Europe uh, and beyond. And in addition to that, uh, uh, NCE is also very active when it comes to the um, uh, the drafting, the implementation, as well as the further uh, refinement or updating of guidelines when it comes to uh, uh, market system or um, system development. Uh, in my group, the Market Integration Working Group, we cover uh, two network codes and we are just in process of updating the day ahead one, uh, as mentioned earlier. 
uh, which went live uh, already in 2020, 2015, um, and now in 2022 or 2023, more likely, we will see an updated version coming to even more harmonization across Europe. Although there are a couple of topics which are still under discussions, I am rather hopeful that we can move forward with um, rather sensible items such as the op organizational um, changes or opportunities that we have now found um, in European, particularly day ahead, as well as intraday market coupling, putting them under one umbrella of organization. And also, as you have seen, maybe the press release earlier this week um, to um, also um, set new boundaries for uh, decision making and inclusion of third parties such as stakeholders. Uh, on the next page, you can see uh, the progress that uh, we are... Andre, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We are still uh, seeing the, the first uh, slide, unfortunately. Oh, okay, now we are uh, at the third one. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, sorry for that. Please uh, interrupt me if I'm going the wrong way. Bit of difficulties with Zoom, to be, on, uh, to be honest. But okay. Um, as you can see on the screen, um, uh, and I think this has also been shown earlier in some of the presentations, uh, uh, relatively large topology that we are now covering these days. Um, um, I think two important items are uh, um, uh, need, need to be explained. One is that, of course, interconnection is uh, at the heart of uh, market coupling. Uh, but uh, what we have seen um, is that uh, one, the topology evolves. So not just new countries uh, are adding, but also new lines um, or bidding zones um, have emerged over the years and future ones will be coming, uh, whether then also uh, new countries outside of the topology that we currently see today will be included, that uh, remains to be seen. But uh, we already do uh, increase the, the level of interconnection, but also the way of working by uh, based on a harmonized principle. Uh, at the moment, we have, um, as you can see, uh, only Ireland um, included in the system or in, in this uh, joint algorithm that we operate. Whereas uh, there is no interconnection right now due to the fact that uh, the UK is uh, decoupled from the uh, day ahead market uh, due to the Brexit. Nonetheless, there are um, uh, is an interconnection uh, currently planned towards France, which would then um, give the opportunity again, uh, not just uh, to run Ireland and Northern Ireland in an isolated mode in our system, but also to operate them with the capacity of this um, new interconnector. Um, Moreover, we have a multitude of um, items or achievements over the years, and there will be a multitude of items to be covered in the future, uh, such as, as a more of an evolution when it comes to flow-based, um, the capacity calculation system, which is more uh, relevant for um, highly meshed grids or AC grids, uh, where flows cannot be predicted as, as um, they're, for example, non-connected or, or HVDC-connected uh, systems. Um, and one major item we are currently working on as well is the inclusion of 14 minutes, uh, 15 minutes products or, or quarter hours. Due to the fact that the renewables, uh, and particularly in the northern and, and, and the Baltic Sea, are ever increasing uh, in gigawatts, uh, therefore uh, shorter measurements of a market time unit are needed to cope with that. And uh, we are hopeful that moving forward with the, of course, with constraints, also um, uh, technical, but also time-wise on the day at market, uh, we will be able to to uh, to foster that. Um, as a matter of fact, um, what you can see here is um, also on the public website of um, the, the single day head coupling, or um, as we call it now, the market coupling uh, joint project, which um, uh, have also a website. So they are on the quarterly basis uh, presentations data, uh, as well as. Um, uh, parts of the contracts that we are have, um, using altogether, as well as the algorithm that we use in Europe, is uh, publicly available. So, of course, for every third party that is interested about uh, the, the further refinement of this cooperation uh, can then on a frequent basis be updated. Um, but uh, not just uh, the advancement on the day ahead, but also the intraday markets. Uh, are shown on this screen that we have here. Uh, we are here not yet uh, with the full topology. Um, we are still missing two countries, but um, that hopefully will also be uh, then concluded uh, by the end of the this year or early next year. Um, uh, and in this process, we are uh, operating a continuous market, um, which um, um, is um, 
pulling more and more and in increased liquidity across all um, the topology. We have seen relatively small um, liquid intraday markets in, in most countries, but uh, with um, market coupling also now extended to intraday, we see essentially all, almost every month a, a new record and uh, uh, just the last three months also with the high pressure of the prices uh, we have seen millions of bids being placed and transactions being made uh, per month so uh, we are not talking about um, trades or individual trades now anymore um, on a on a second basis but now more and more shifting to uh, millisecond milliseconds uh, one hour uh, to delivery and even those kinds of discussions are ongoing, whether there are opportunities. In addition to that, we are uh, seeing that there are points of optimizations. Uh, we call them intraday auctions uh, to bring all market participants uh, and all abilities of market participants together to trade uh, more complex products uh, before the start of the intraday market, also within uh, the timings of the intraday market across Europe. Um, I think that was a relatively quick rundown, but uh, with the uh, time limitation, I hope that, uh, Simona, this is okay for you and everybody, uh, for sure. I'm much willing to uh, enter into discussions if time allows. Uh, nonetheless, um, please also drop me an email if you have any additional questions. And we are rather transparent also what we do. So please also visit the website of the single intraday and single day ahead coupling where we frequently update the milestones we reached and those where we are still working on and how to move in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. I, I very much appreciate that you, you managed to, 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 to compress, I mean, to, to, to show us uh, uh, well, where, uh, uh, what, what, what would be a, a real uh, uh, nice target uh, in terms of, uh, of market integration, of course, uh, as it was mentioned at the beginning by uh, Hervé, uh, I believe uh, it took probably 25 or 30 years, or I don't know how many, to, 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 to reach this level. Um, no, 20, 25. Uh, sorry. So now we have 17 years in the making. We started with 2005 and um, okay. then from a regional, now we are to a pan regional or European uh, system. They had an intraday as well as long term yeah. and uh, balancing. Oh, yeah, f f thank you. Uh, so, I mean, of course, it, it could, uh, I mean, to get there, we need to, we, to, to agree. Uh, uh, on uh, a legislative framework because we understood uh, from the, this in this panel that uh, also from the experience of South African power pool we felt that uh, uh, I mean everything starts with uh, with that but I mean we have seen in this first panel that uh, the benefit and the different experience around the world uh, uh, all working that direction so seems to be no no regret option no regret path uh, i thank you uh, all all the panelists uh, and i will uh, uh, i see that there are no not much question uh, so uh, i i will leave the floor now uh, to to benoit uh, who from madrag uh, uh, who will moderate the, the second panel um so interesting insight for the first, in the first panel. Sorry for not respecting uh, Benoit, not being able to respect the, 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 the time. So we have 10 minutes uh, delay, uh, but I think uh, for good reason, many, uh, many, uh, many useful uh, uh, contribution. Benoit, the floor is yours. Yes. I want to thanks again, uh, uh, every, uh, the, the panelists, distinguished panelists, and talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Simone. No, no problem for for this this time you you spend because I think it well the, the panel deserved uh, to spend a little bit more minutes on, on these complicated topics. And uh, here are we, we with the second panel. I think we we have something which is quite complementary to uh, to this this first one with this uh, sharing of experiences. And what I get from the latest uh, presentation from NSOE is that actually. It's a long process. It's a, it's a complicated process. 
And one of my points, um, I will be sure that I'm delivering a short introduction be before giving the floor to the panelists, but, but I, I wanted to, to share with you a few elements from, from Medreg's experience uh, in terms of uh, market integration. Um, it is that, well, the analogy, the example of, um, of the European Union is very interesting, but we always have to remember that it's specific to the EU. And <clears throat> it's, it's important to have a look at uh, the, the fundamentals of the market. And I remember now, it's almost five years ago, I went to Madrid to a MedTS workshop. It was the first time we had a joint meeting. And, uh, and we had this uh, a very interesting discussion on, on uh, the, the, this question of uh, market integration. What is technical, what is not? And one of the important points was that the assessment on technical terms was quite clear. And uh, I think that, uh, well, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, was, uh, went also in that direction. Uh, um, well, seeing, well, uh, acknowledging that the interconnections in the Maghreb are not used at their highest level. And the point was that when we discussed uh, with the TSOs that there were some elements which were missing, and it's precisely the, 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 the topic we're going to discuss uh, right now. And what was missing was, in particular, the interpretation of the objectives and how to collectively go ahead with a, a new organization. So let me just share a few slides. Uh, so sorry, I'm not using Zoom uh, quite often. So I'm I hope it's going to work. Um, all right, so. Yes, it does. OK, so uh, a few words about our experience in terms of this market integration. And just to say that um, actually, the approach we have been having uh, during the past few years in Medreg was precisely to assess the situation and to start from this idea that regulation is all, all often pointed out as the missing element, the missing link. But uh, what is complicated is to think about what is regulation and how to regulate. Because regulation, it's about making decisions which have to be effective uh, in the end. And we try to elaborate on reflections about the maturity of systems I will not go into the details of this slide, but what we should have in mind is that trading energy between countries, and it's precisely the experience of the EU, it depends on a few fundamentals. And when we implemented liberalization and this market integration, we started from a situation where we had strong systems, we had interconnections, and somewhere we could share uh, some, some surpluses of energy, which allowed to go towards some solidarity. Outside of the EU, and especially around the Mediterranean, we all know that the situation is slightly different. We are in dynamic systems where progressively we have a, a, a demand which increases quite quickly. And we are, let's say, the systems are somewhere running after a demand. And what is very important is to, add the, to, to bring the systems at the, the, the right level while decarbonizing, and the big question is how to build upon interconnections to, uh, on potential solidarities in order to make that system work even better. That's the big challenge we have uh, in front of us. And among this, we, these topics, we have worked also with MedTSO on the interconnection development, because we also see some issues in terms of interconnection capacity. and. Uh, how to, uh, and it was a point also addressed in this, uh, this uh, previous session, uh, the first session, to have some joint agendas between countries in order to build lines and, and let's say, progressively go towards these exchanges, which she require, I would say, some technical compatibility. And that's been the role, especially of MedTSO working on market integration and on this reflection on, uh, about Greece codes, um, this need for surpluses of energy to exchange and also need uh, something which is building confidence. And I think that the European history 
shows that uh, developing confidence is, is a cornerstone in the development of uh, uh, cross-border transactions. I will finish my, my short introduction with this slide to show that in the MENA region, actually we have several different situations. Let's say that in the Maghreb, we are more uh, in, in, in a situation where we're looking for some uh, regulatory harmonization, while more in the East, in the Maastricht, we have this question of bringing at the higher levels the uh, NTC net transfer capacity to improve energy trade. So a few elements. Now, before getting to, to the panel, um, the panel where the, what is interesting is that we're gonna talk largely about investment. I was uh, introducing this element of bringing systems at the right level and especially allowing to create surpluses and to have some energy to share before giving the, 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 the floor to first Roberto Vigotti from Breast for Africa and then the, the other panelists. Uh, just to say that it's another aspect, I just mentioned this uh, because we are talking a lot about green electricity, but we all know that exchanging uh, uh, green power is first exchanging electricity surpluses. And what is important is to maximize the share of green energy within the energy mixes. And, and it's, it's difficult to, let's say, to track the exchanges. We're not exactly talking about green electricity exchanges. Anyway, I stop there. And um, Roberto, if you are in the room, uh, I would invite you to get in and to uh, present the uh, rest for yes. Africa yeah. positions and experience. Uh, sorry, I stopped sharing my screen. And, and uh, Roberto, I think you have quite a, a very interesting experience because you've been dealing with these questions of how to integrate renewable energy sources, how to make the uh, investment environment getting to the right direction in order to facilitate this, this development of green electricity. Roberto, Thank you so you. much, Benoit. Thank you so much. And thank you also to Angelo Ayassan for uh, inviting us here. Uh, it, uh, first of all, congratulations for the quality of the information and the quality of the recommendation you are giving. Uh, as you know, we have been working less for med since 10 years. Now we're working a lot also in, in Southern Africa and in Eastern Africa. So for me, it's really refreshing to see the progress that we are doing, you are doing there. And I hope in the future also as well, we are going to work to collaborate in sharing each other point of view. I'm the Secretary General of Res for Med slash Res for Africa. It's a group of uh, in, uh, mostly private sector investors, banks, utility, manufacturer, lawyers, consulting, you see all of them. And we, our aim is to create a framework for uh, um, investment uh, in the African continent. Just to tell you quickly in one second, what we have done in the med area lately, you see if, if, if by each country, but also very important, the survey we have done uh, last year on assessing investment risk in renewable energy. And you can download this one from your uh, uh, website as well. Our website is uh, free. You can go there with no password and no registration, and you can take down whatever you like to, to see. Uh, the program for MED uh, this year uh, is this one. We have analyzing, advocate, and support. And we have chosen a few elements uh, you see from grid flexibility in Tunisia, from seawater in, in Morocco, et cetera, et cetera, because those are the requests uh, from our um, stakeholder uh, inside the uh, foundation and also outside the foundation. But now let me give you some complementary views, some complementary information uh, to your work. Uh, last year, we have done this uh, uh, publication, um, 10 years of renewable energy in MENA, what has not happened? And uh, I again encourage you to download this uh, publication, which tells you something very, very um, dramatic. Only 0.5% of the additional world renewable deployment in the world happened in South Med. If you consider also MENA, you go up to just 1%. You see that the number. In the world, left to red, you see there were um, 1,360 gigawatt in 10 years deployed. And in the Southern Med, 0.5% was this one, which they makes really no sense, really, if you see on top, six gigawatt only. This is a very um, 
storytelling because as we have ambition to get to the so-called transition, let's be honest, we're starting from a very, very low um, anticipation. Why this happened? Well, there are many factors. Those are the factors that our, our investors find. You know all of them, regulation, of course, uh, tenders, uh, for particularly the tender process, uh, the business environment, of course, but you see, you just see them. For us, those are the suggestion we are giving to the country to uh, take uh, stock of those questions. And of course, the PPA. Now, um, even, even currency and convertibility, even uh, the use of only local currency, uh, currency and, or even local components. These are things that in the, in the South Med are quite dramatic. So um, we would like to um, provide you as a, a club of uh, private and banks our position so that is your common work, as you said, Benoit, to increase the investment. Of course, the grids are also very important. We do see you know, not only in, in, in MED, but in MENA, but also in the southern part of Africa, the grid investments need to be really huge. Unfortunately, it seems to me that even when we talk about transition, a lot of attention is given to renewable or to clean energy or to artificial green hydrogen, but not much on grids. It's like when you talk about cars, you don't talk about freeways and roadway. So we are now in this moment, actually, I was jumping like, uh, Andre, from another meeting, I was inaugurating our integration in the grid the workshop to 300 young Africans online. And I think we have to take a lot of attention to the grid infrastructure. Uh, we also see the losses. We have also business model who don't allow, particularly we are very uh, preoccupied because the non-cost effective tariff in most countries in Africa, you know, only Umeme from Uganda is a profitable, is a private uh, utility they don't allow the investment in not only the maintenance in operation, but also they don't allow investment for new eyes. So that's, we think that we need to allow private sector, also African private sector to be involved in the investment in the grid and infrastructure. There are of course many benefits I don't want to teach you, but those are from today, I just showed this one to the, 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 the students here from the transition to a low carbon future, to the decentralization, to of course uh, demand disruption, they have to accept that now uh, the one way only generation transmission distribution is now disruptive also in Africa and the more automated operation of the system. So that uh, it's interesting in the survey, take a look. We asked uh, our uh, uh, stakeholder, both private and public, and the private people said grid access and inflation and financing were the most important factor for uh, invest, invest, investing in the country. While the public, um, they see the grid access was much lower. Uh, so you see the perception of the uh, uh, of investment risk from private sector and public sector, it's really different. That's very interesting to know. And of course, it's very uh, uh, variable also along the country from Morocco, which have a bigger, uh, uh, much bigger um, uh, division between the two well, up to Libya, Algeria and well, Lebanon were not. But that's interesting. If you take a look at this uh, uh, 40 pages um, assessment, invest assessing investment, you may learn something also here. Finally, I just close by saying, okay, I saw before from Benoit, yes, there are three main international connections, but again, only 2% of the total annual generation is traded across the border for different reasons, lacking, uh, you already said, Benoit, uh, 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 what you had to be said. We are also studying the Southern Pool, the Eastern African Pool. I think this is something that has to be underlined. Uh, not because we want to teach our European story, but so much in terms of economic, in terms of investment, we can really uh, uh, show that it works. And my final one is, in fact, uh, in our book, I say interconnection in between uh, regions is essential because not only, and also at Brussels level, they claim this one internationally, even at the Africa, um, let's say, uh, uh, commissioner on energy because they are functional market by bring pricing policy, utility and efficiency. I mean, overall, we agree with you and we, I'm really glad to be able today to learn from you and uh, transfer also the uh, lesson learned, the track record and your recommendation to other parts of the continent. Thank you so much, Benoit, and I hope it was interesting for you. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Roberto, for your for getting straight to the straight to the point and um our
particularly appreciate your, your slide on this question of risk perception, because I guess that this question of risk is absolutely critical in the current developments. Well, risks are about also concrete situations. And, and you mentioned this, this difference between the uh, public and private sectors. How would you interpret these differences? Is it because the kind of, of role, well, their roles are different? Uh, and and in, in terms of quick wins then, what would be your advice beyond, well, the development of networks and interconnections, which take quite a lot of time, but in, this, in the current system, what should we do first? Well, I think the, the reason for this perception is because, in fact, the investor, you know, international investor have different choices where to go. When a, a big company like EDF or NGONL has to go to the so-called investment committee, they prefer maybe to go to Mexico or to Colombia or to Thailand because uh, they are sure. Uh, on the other high end, in Africa, sometimes it's even one, we see that the understanding or the uh, consistency of the uh, government there are not strong. Think about, uh, let's forget it for a moment, Med. Ethiopia makes a, a, a scaling solar project in Sora. They got there, they win five finalists, NLDF, other. At the end, the Ethiopian government said, oh, I like scaling solar regulatory system, but I, one exception, I don't recognize the conversion of the currency. <laughs> At this point, the World Bank disappears. You know, one, a consortium of a Chinese and Arab because they don't care about risk perception. So just give an example sharp. So that's the, the reason. Then now we are convincing Ethiopia to go back and restore the currency uh, evaluation. So all those are things that I think is a problem of also of understanding the, the, the real mechanism of a true market. And uh, what I will say, well, um, bringing a solution, bringing track record, not only from Europe, but why? Because when you go to Africa, particularly Southern Africa, they don't like you go from Roma, from Paris, or from Brussels. We bring to them the story of uh, Latin America, the story of uh, Far East, and they try to understand it's a global uh, track. So my suggestion is to do seminar, uh, institutional capacity building, and provide a case study for this. Thank you, Benoit. Yeah, thank you very much um, for these this important points, which will deserve some more discussions, I guess, <laughs> no doubt. And uh, nobody, this question of investment, the investment climate is, of course, uh, too, too cr crucial. And I would say on the institutional side, uh, one of our, our willingness is to, to improve this uh, investment uh, climate. Uh, maybe uh, let me switch to uh, to Juan uh, Rodriguez um, from MedTSO. Juanma, who has been very active, we've been working together on many topics and including this question of this um, regulatory harmonization in the Mediterranean. Um, then, so uh, Juanma, the floor is yours to present the METSO activities in this area. Hello, good morning. Uh, I think that you see and hear, my, my, hear me. I think that you, you see my presentation. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, my, my name is Juanma Rodriguez. I work for Red Electric at España, the, the Spanish TSO. However, I'm here today with the hat of Met TSO, the chairperson of the Technical Committee Regulation. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, the, the question for the, the just now panel is uh, electricity trading in with the MENA region, what are the missing links requirements? Well, the first thought uh, that uh, came up to my mind is electricity trading. Electricity trading means um, the movement of uh, energy, movement of energy uh, through the in this case, the international interconnections. Well, the MENA region, I think that is a, there is a consensus. Uh, sometimes the, the, the area is uh, bigger than others, but in this case, just now, today, we are reducing the space to the South and East Mediterranean countries. Uh, Dealing with links, I'm an electrical engineer. I work for a TSO. Then for me, the links are the first 
idea is the lines. And then requirements. The requirements are related with uh, rules and regulations. Uh, you see here our Mediterranean power system. Uh, the, the, you see that uh, in some parts there are, there are not many lines. Uh, also, such lines are very long with uh, challenging uh, issues for the operators, the control to control the voltage, to control the frequency. Also, in our area, we have two, two big blocks. One is the synchronized with uh, the European continental system. Another one is the Easter part, the eight countries. And also, we have in the middle the Mediterranean Sea, which is blocking the possibility to expand interconnections, whatever. So, also, you know, the operation of a such power system introduces also challenging issues. You know, the tripping of a big generator in Tunisia. And thanks to the primary regulation, well, sorry, frequency containment reserve, there is a power flow crossing the Morocco Argelia lines. And then, in order to prevent possible uh, disturbances, the international interconnections are equipped with special protection systems, special protection systems that also limit the possibility to exchange the power. Uh, what is the state? I invite you to visit our website, the METSO website. Uh, here you see only some examples, uh, figures from the last year. Really, 2020 is uh, a strange uh, year, a pandemic year, no? and then also has effect in the consumption and the generation data. But if you see the different uh, numbers dealing with the imports and import, exports in the different borders, the conclusion is that uh, there is not um, many, many exchanges or big exchanges. That's only uh, an example. So I move to the most complicated issue, rules and requirements. Uh, well, the first thing that uh, we or I take from our uh, discussions is that uh, in many parts of the many of the MENA countries, there is not a regional or electricity market. We have many national markets. Uh, the international trading is based on contractual bilateral agreements. And we identify that we have to work in the progress in the coordinated regulation for international interconnections. And even more, Han, some uh, colleagues in our discussions identify the need of a responsible authority with, with neutral and transparent dispute settlement. So what we can offer from METSO? Uh, you know that uh, thanks to the European Commission, we have a third project, is the TCMET project. TCMET is not a TC project, where we work in different directions. Some of them uh, repeat many of the uh, words that we have uh, heard this morning. Planning, regulation, exchanges, operation, knowledge sharing. Well, in our uh, project, uh, we have different pillars, uh, typical pillars, but also in the, in the a role or in the space of the regulation, we are working in a kind of uh, harmonious uh, harmonization, dealing with the 
technical rules, we have prepared many good documents, many good deliverables dealing with issues, aspects, key aspects, more key aspects, the most key aspects, and uh, uh, most of the then the methodology that we have followed was to work under our TSO uh, vision. We prepare uh, discussions, we prepare uh, surveys, we exchange data, we exchange these uh, reports. However, uh, I think that it's important and for this TCMET uh, project and for the closing topic of today, we think that we have to ask the opinion and the vision of the stakeholders. Also, this harmonious harmonization takes a lot of time. Then we have moved in order to go in a faster way. We have identified some areas in the MENA countries where it is possible to apply some pilot projects. Uh, we have uh, different areas, and for instance, in the case of the Maghreb, we have identified uh, for SAT the international interconnections is a precondition. And we have uh, identified the issues, and also we uh, get from our uh, uh, members which are his, this uh, prioritization. And in the case of the uh, Maghreb area, we are working in a, uh, we are designing and working in, a, in order to design a platform for the trade of energy. Well, I would like to, to finish with some remarks. Uh, the physics and dynamics, the structure of the power system imposes certain challenging uses. These uses also are more challenging where we are, in all of us, we are involved in an energy transition. You know the volatility of renewables and the challenges that is kind of energy introduce. Those challenges impact the electricity trading. Of course, it, need, it is need to work and to develop a coordinated regulation for international interconnections. In our opinion, the identification of pilot zones and this zonal approach is a good way uh, to go forward. And of course, all of us are involved in the energy transition. And for the TCMET project, and also for many, many other aspects of our life, the cooperation is essential. Thank you for your opinion. Thank you very much, um, Juanma, for, for these elements. And I think you pointed out the, the very important priorities and, and you're right saying that the grid is uh, absolutely important and we, we need to, to build these links uh, between, between the systems. And um, METSO has worked quite a lot on the Maghreb region. And could you share with us uh, a few conclusions from that work on uh, this um, uh, market integration in the, in the Maghreb? I know that you have elaborated on more, more details and, and technical issues and would be, I guess, interesting as a complement to your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Benoit. Yeah, uh, well, uh, well, I think I, we know uh, the target, no, to allow the, the trading of electricity. So, um, this uh, pilot project for for the Maghreb area, we have organized the work in, or we are going to organize the work in two steps. The first step is to analyze the status of the regulatory framework. In parallel, we, and today we have on the first panel, very good examples. 
very good examples on how to uh, uh, good practices and how to uh, go forward. That's for the first step. And the second step is the definition of cooperation principles for the different uh, possible market configurations. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much. And uh, I've seen a, a question in the chat, which was uh, directly asked to me um, about uh, the uh, plans to interconnect Egypt and Greece. Actually, um, it's difficult for me to give more uh, elements. I don't know exactly the kind of answer you, you expect from me. I don't know, Juanma, if you have some information about that, but uh, uh, otherwise, I mean, uh, maybe, uh, Fevo, so you, you could ask directly your question during the, the final session uh, of Q&A uh, to, to see the, what kind of information you are looking for. Um, but then let me uh, jump before this Q&A, uh, jump to, to Tariq um, Haman from, from, from Mazen. So I think Mazen is a very interesting organization because as you, you know, it's a, uh, a public entity, but dealing with uh, private investors as well, and and with this uh, this big task of raising at very high levels the share of renewables in Morocco. So, um, please, Tariq, the floor is yours. I'm looking for your elements on on the Moroccan experience. Thank you very much, Benoit. Thanks to the organizers. My pleasure to be with you today to share a little bit our experience uh, and what we have done in, in Mazen. I don't know if you, you can see my uh, screen. Yes. Perfect. So uh, first of all, a few words about Mazen and... Uh, uh, Just a remark, to... if, if you can switch to the, 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 uh, the screen where you, you have the full slide. I, I think it's the case now. You don't, you, don't, you don't see the full slide? Well, we also have, you know, the following uh, slide. Okay. I don't know, anyway, it's not a big issue. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank Let's you very much. The comfort so, of attendees. On, on my side, uh, just one. I hope it's better now. Otherwise, I will, uh, I will continue with oh, it. It's OK, it's OK. Please go ahead. Perfect. So as you mentioned, uh, Benoit, Morocco has established from 2009 uh, an interesting strategy to develop renewables with a quite uh, challenging uh, targets to reach around 42% of our installed capacity from renewables by what we call the horizon 2020 and a minimum of 52% by 2030. And in order to implement uh, this, and especially in the solar sector, the state decide to create Mazen by law as a, an authority uh, with a special statute because we are a private company, uh, but our uh, main, uh, our, uh, our shareholder are the state. So we have this flexibility of dealing like a private company but in the meantime, we are an authority and also, of course, have the support of the state. And the, when Mazen was created in 2010, the uh, target was to develop uh, solar because the S of Mazen at that time was uh, solar. And we started developing uh, projects by started by WorldZ, then of course, the others that comes to reach uh, around 2000, uh, megawatt of solar to, uh, project uh, for the horizon 2020. In uh, 2016, uh, uh, and after the accomplishment of the first project, the state, the state decide to uh, integrate or to transfer the whole uh, renewable assets into Mazen 
and to uh, make Mazen responsible for the development of, for the implementation of the Moroccan strategy in terms of renewable energy. So the S of solar becomes sustainable, of course, with a, uh, uh, an enhance of our uh, scope of actions. And of course, we work closely with the OENE, which is the grid operator, and also one of our uh, shareholder. Uh, by the way, myself, I used to work for OENE for uh, at least uh, 14 years before I joined uh, Mazen. And uh, with, of course, the background of being aware of the transmission uh, concern of, and, of course, the, uh, the responsibility of uh, uh, having this uh, feeding uh, the demand uh, all the time. Uh, Morocco has the advantage of having quite great resources in terms of renewables, especially wind and solar. Uh, the solar, we found it everywhere. Of course, some sites are more adequate to develop uh, CSP, where the direct uh, uh, radiation are, are better, mainly in the Atlas Mountain uh, areas. And of course, wind uh, are also very interesting in the north, uh, around the region of Isawira, and all in, in the south of the country. In, in terms of hydro, Morocco, of course, developed hydro from beginning of this century. Uh, we are close to use all of our potential. Uh, by today, we have more than 1,700 megawatt installed capacity. But the remaining one uh, and the remaining project will be more focused on developing hydro pumping storage unit in order to use it as a storage of electricity for supporting the grid, especially when we are having such ki kind of uh, massive introduction of uh, renewables. Of course, the, the action of Mazen uh, consider different things, not only the, uh, the production of electricity, but really to uh, establish an ecosystem around uh, uh, around uh, the uh, the renewable project and the renewable strategy in order to take the maximum add value from it. So by, by today we have an installed capacity in Morocco of more than 10 giga, and uh, around 39 percent of it, about 4,000 4, megawatt, are renewables, uh, split of wind, solar, and hydro. So almost uh, 1 giga, 1.4 giga of wind, uh, more than 8,800 megawatt of solar, and around 1,700 uh, one meg uh, one, uh, megawatt of uh, Tarek, if, if I may, I see you have 19 slides. I, so I, I, time I, is I, I running. Will I will go straight to the most interesting yes, one. Yes, yes, please. Thank you. So just here presenting the coming project, as I mentioned, we have more than uh, another four giga under construction or under development that allow us, in fact, to reach the target of 52% of our stand capacity before 2030. And if we take it in consideration the advancement of the project, we expect to reach it by 2025 or 2026. And if we consider the uh, the, uh, the projection of the grid operator of OENE, uh, we are going to reach by 2030 almost 65% of our installed capacity from renewables and around 50% or 52% of the energy from renewables, which is very challenging in terms of uh, intermittency. And for that, we uh, consider that we are going to develop uh, at least another one giga of hydro pumping storage, of course, and uh, also developing uh, interconnections. As you know, we have uh, by today more than uh, 1,500 interconnection capacity, megawatt capacity with, with Spain, uh, which is fully used and commercial exchange of more than 950 megawatt. We have another capacity with uh, Algeria, 1,000 also and 500 megawatt. This is more used as a mutual support for both countries. And we are uh, developing interconnection with uh, uh, Mauritania, 
uh, a line of 400 kV. Also, a third line with the pain in order to enhance the capacity by adding at least se between 700 and 1 giga of capacity. And also, there is another uh, project of building uh, uh, another line with DC line with Portugal of 1 giga. This will allow us to have in Morocco uh, around a capacity of uh, exchanging interconnection uh, that will exceed 4 giga. And if we add also the capacity of storage that we are developing, hydro storage or melting salt or um, battery storage, we will have another 2 giga of, of, of storage. And within these capacities of storage and, uh, and uh, exchange, I think we'll have enough uh, capacity to deal with the intermediacy and to reach our target for uh, 2030 and even uh, later. I want to conclude with uh, an, an action uh, in another, in a commercial way and cooperation where we are also uh, with the support of the World Bank and the European Commission uh, working on an initiative that we call the SET Roadmap. It's Sustainable Energy Trade Roadmap. Uh, it's uh, a work that has been established by five countries, Morocco, Spain, Portugal, Germany, and France. The target is, is to create a market between uh, this first, these countries, but then to extend it to the whole Mediterranean area in order to trade and to exchange electricity uh, produced from renewables. We have been uh, progressing on, on, on that and we expect to uh, sign an agreement this year in order to start the implementation, especially on the transborder PPA. So this is a very important initiative and we are actually the secretary general of this uh, of this initiative and i want uh, last point is africa morocco by uh, mazenbay is uh, its uh, mission and in, it's in, in our law we are also committed to support the development of renewables in uh, in, in in africa and uh, and for that we are uh, having many uh, development with different countries our action, depending on the need of country, can be technical support or institutional support, training and uh, capacity building, but also development, co-development with the uh, local en entities or uh, development renewable project there. So this is what I, I have to do uh, to, 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 to tell you today. And uh, feel free if there is any question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tarek. Maybe we could be we will be back to, to questions uh, during the Q and A because time is running. And um, I would have a question about your expectations uh, regarding the the interconnections for for the the valuation and financing of renewables. But maybe if we have we, we'll see that if we have some time remaining during the Q and A. And let's go directly to Mo Sherry from the World Bank. And I think that here it's a uh, uh, an important uh, contribution to, to the debate uh, with, with uh, of course, a very important organization for supporting investment and, and contributing to the improvement of the investment climate. Moes, the floor is yours. Uh, okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, very interesting uh, uh, event. Uh, I'm very happy to represent the, uh, the World Bank. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Can, uh, can you see my, uh, my yes. screen? Yes. Okay, okay, great. Uh, so I will uh, quite briefly, I will say uh, a few words about uh, the barriers to electricity trade uh, between and with MENA countries, uh, with a special focus on uh, Maghreb uh, countries. So, 
Okay, okay. Are you on the, the second slide? Um, so basically, uh, the World Bank has been uh, supporting this uh, uh, initiative, very uh, interesting initiative called the Pan-Arab Electricity Market, uh, together with the uh, League of Arab States, and of course, all the, the member countries of the, uh, of the League of Arab States. The, the purpose is to uh, gradually uh, develop uh, a, a working electricity market uh, in, the, in the, the MENA region and between uh, Arab countries. Um, so this initiative started in 2016. It's a, it's a gradual process, but um, basically the purpose is to build the right uh, governance structures and institutions. So of course, focusing on, uh, uh, on, on having the right regulations for this to, uh, to happen, uh, focused on having uh, market-based uh, solutions to, to enable this regional electricity trade. Of course, it, uh, initially, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm building on, on what uh, uh, other colleagues have said uh, before, like uh, Mr. Rodriguez, uh, the, the trade currently is essentially bilateral, um, but the, 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 the purpose is to gradually go to a, to a multilateral uh, trading arrangements. Um, also, the purpose is to identify investments that are needed to, uh, to enable this trade to happen. This, of course, is essentially, uh, uh, will take the form of, uh, uh, of interconnectors uh, between uh, between countries. So, what are the main uh, barriers to uh, this trade uh, happening between uh, Arab countries? So, uh, even for existing interconnectors, we looked at the at the utilization of uh, of existing uh, interconnection capacity, and it's it's very low. Uh, I think, uh, as I, I heard uh, Tarek say earlier, I mean, between Morocco and Algeria, uh, even when, when the connection was active, basically it's, it's essentially backing up uh, each other's network in, in case of, uh, of emergency, uh, but there is very, very, you know, very limited uh, trade. So, uh, uh, so, so th this is the symptom, really, and even moving to, uh, you know, using uh, these interconnectors, uh, uh, at least like one third of capacity, would uh, would, would would bring, you know, tremendous benefits uh, to the to, to all parties. Uh, so, what are the main reasons? I mean, basically, you have a problem of pricing. Uh, electricity in the Arab world is essentially generated using natural gas. But this natural gas is, uh, is most of the time subsidized. And then there are other uh, subsidies in the, in the electricity sector. So it, it then it, it distorts the, the, the market. And uh, when, when your domestic gas is subsidized, the, the, the incentive, it, it creates a disincentive from uh, importing from uh, from other countries. Um, also, the lack of liquidity. I mean, even in on the national markets, you have a lack of liquidity. Uh, I think, as was mentioned before, uh, in in the MENA region, until recently, I mean, there was very little uh, spare capacity. I mean, very few countries had any excess capacity that they could trade. Uh, this is changing. Uh, uh, Egypt is, is building uh, quite significant amounts of excess capacity, and so is Saudi Arabia. And they, 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 they are planning to become uh, kind of trading hubs uh, in, the, in the region. So let me uh, zoom in on the, uh, on, on the Maghreb sub-region. Um, so what, what are the main, uh, the, 
characteristics of this uh, of this region and and what are the the hurdles basically i mean you it's you know the tensions between algeria and morocco are well known and uh, this is uh, this is a, a hurdle to to developing uh, trading arrangements i mean the, uh, currently actually even the 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 connection is uh, is is inactive uh, you also have instability in Libya and the lack of synchronicity that we have seen between, you know, the, the uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia that are synchronized with the European market, and then the rest uh, uh, of uh, of MENA, including Libya, which which is on a uh, on a different uh, frequency. So. But all these features uh, mean that uh, Maghreb countries essentially are much more focused on trading with Europe than uh, on trading with each other. Uh, so you have Morocco, obviously, is more advanced. They, they have two uh, connections with Spain. They are working on, a, on a, a new connection with Portugal. They're even working on a very ambitious uh, project called X-Links, uh, you know, private sector, to, to have a subsea connection uh, with the UK. Um, you have uh, Tunisia, uh, with, uh, which is planning the Elmed interconnector with uh, Italy, and the, the World Bank uh, is uh, strongly involved in uh, supporting this, uh, this project with uh, uh, the, the, the right uh, feasibility studies. Um, so in this partnership with Europe, Basically, the Maghreb countries uh, need access to capacity, uh, stability, and ancillary services that are uh, basically uh, would be more available in, in this much larger electricity grid. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the Maghreb can offer very abundant and competitive solar power to Europe, as, as was just uh, mentioned by, uh, by my colleague uh, Tarek. So, uh, you know, again, to, to, to go a bit deeper uh, into, you know, what are the key hurdles to the power trade? I think, that, I mean, this has been mentioned by others. It's, it's basically on the, on the regulatory side. And I would like to expand a little bit on this uh, SET initiative that was uh, mentioned by Tarek. So basically, it's uh, the, in, indeed the, 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 the secretariat is... Uh, is, is led by Mazen and the, the, with the uh, technical support from the, from the, the World Bank. Um, so what, so far, what are the, you know, the key uh, conclusions or the key recommendations of this, uh, of this work? You know, one, uh, you need to allow non-discriminatory mechanism for capacity allocation on interconnect you know so in, in this case on, on the existing spain morocco interconnectors uh, broadly speaking you need a convergence between moroccan law and the eu acquis communautaire which is essentially all the 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 the, the legal and regulatory system for uh, for the the power sector uh, so in uh, uh, particularly uh, you would need to uh, allow direct imports and exports between private players in Morocco and the EU. The, the, uh, I mean, corporate PPA is, is seen as the, the key instrument to take this forward. Uh, you need, uh, I think this was mentioned before, uh, third-party access to the uh, ONE uh, high-voltage and very high-voltage grid for this, uh, for this purpose. And then on the EU side, you, uh, countries would need to remove any barriers to, uh, to, to having corporate PPAs between, uh, between private players in the EU and, uh, and, and Morocco in this case. But that, this is, so this example is for illustration. I think a lot of the, the conclusions uh, from this uh, initiative would be applicable to other uh, uh, to, to other interconnectors like uh, like Tunisia, Italy, and others that are being planned. So thank you very much. Uh, let me stop there. 
Thank you very much. And uh, I see a lot of questions uh, in the chat. And unfortunately, that would require you to have, a, I don't know, whether one more hour to answer all, all of them. But, but I think that, that some of them are, what, what I get from, from these points, it's about, well, the relevant business models for interconnections, and especially between uh, non-EU countries and the EU, and also how to build confidence. Well, to, to give a few words on my side, and then maybe, Mose, you, you, you could give us uh, your views. I would say, well, confidence is something which is developed over time, and, and it comes with, uh, without talking about uh, the uh, political questions. In terms of, of uh, electricity ex exchange, it comes with the robustness of systems and bridging no, robust systems helps really de developing confidence. So maybe Sharif uh, also, um, oh sorry, uh, from from your your perspective um, as the World Bank, and I would add to to this reflection a question about how do you address in in this work the geography? One of the points which we studied with Metieso was precisely the fact that in the MENA region we have let's say unmeshed systems or the, the, while if we compare to, to, to the EU, we have highly matched systems which facilitate exchanging in, in energy and multilateral agreements uh, in particular. And, and how do you include the question of the level of the standards of living of populations? Because poorness is, of course, probably one of the important obstacles to reaching um, an, effect, an efficient market. And then, uh, thank you. Thank you, Benoit. Thank you. I, I mean, I noted two, essentially two questions from you. Uh, so how do you build the confidence? Um, in my view, I mean, the, the, there is no better way of building confidence than by, you know, by, by having transactions. By, I mean, the longer, as long as it remains theoretical and, you know, and, 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 and we talk about it in, in conferences like this, it's, you know, uh, countries and companies, you know, think that it's, it's, uh, it's uh, very difficult to achieve. So, uh, uh, I mean, for example, this uh, set initiative, if it could lead to at least one transaction, you know, one corporate PPA being signed between a Moroccan project and, uh, uh, and, and a corporate in Europe, uh, that, that, that I think this would tremendously, you know, build the, uh, the confidence and the, the same among MENA countries is, is to, to, to actually, uh, you know, have some, some practical uh, transactions. So, of course, yeah. I, I think your second question is referring to the, the geography of, uh, of, 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 of MENA. I mean, the, the fact that you, you know, you have some very uh, large, low density regions. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's very different from, from Europe. But you, I think you have some sub regions, basically, you, you have the Gulf in one area, and the standards of living are, are, are very, very high there. You have the Mashrek, you know, uh, and then and you have the Maghreb. So you, you could, I think, build sub the sub markets first between between those, but with the caveat of what I said in in the Maghreb, the geopolitics also is not currently is not favorable. I mean, we hope you know uh, one day uh, things will change. So so you, you, you know I would not I, I think the the uh, integration with Europe in the case of of the Maghreb is uh, is is extremely important. I mean probably. Integration with Europe will, will probably happen before you have uh, integration within the Maghreb. But the the interconnection, the Tunisia-Italy interconnection, I think will be very very important not just for Tunisia, but it also you know uh, uh, could be very beneficial for Algeria. Uh, Libya could also you know uh, potentially uh, benefit from it. So so it it has uh, it has very good uh, potential. Okay, well, thank you very much for these very clear answers. And uh, let's, uh, let me give you the floor to Gabriel Latour. Sorry for, for the delays, but uh, please feel comfortable.
comfortable uh, developing your speech. Um, well, we started with 10 minutes of delay. It's always difficult to run after time and, and <laughs> to eliminate these, these, these delays. Please, Gabrielle, I'm very interested in getting uh, the BRD views on, on these topics. Uh, floor is yours. You're muted. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Benoit. Um, and thank you very much for uh, MedTSO and MedREG for inviting EBRD. I'm, I'm going to project now uh, this, my slides uh, and so that we can, uh, we can start. Um, so a lot has been said uh, already. Um, so I will try to um, not to be uh, too redundant. Do you see my do you see my slides? I will try to. Uh, yeah, yes, we can see. Not in presentation mode, but okay, we can see. Sorry, oops. Sorry, I got the wrong. Um, let me try something. No, that's not right. Is this better? Um, so um, I will uh, make a contribution uh, to um, uh, first on uh, a few a few uh, a few aspects. Uh, first of all, I will quickly present a bit what EBRD does in the area. So uh, EBRD, as you know, is first and foremost a uh, bank. So we finance uh, uh, a number of projects uh, um, and uh, in the energy sector uh, and uh, with um, uh, and you can see with a growing focus on supporting renewable energy as well as supporting all the green infrastructure required to develop renewable energy. Um, this is the projects we financed over the last few years in the region. Um, what we also do at EBRD is probably less well known is what we call policy dialogue, policy engagement with the, with the different governments and the different regulators of the region. So here is a, a, is a, is a um, quite a detailed list of what we do in the in the region in the southern and eastern mediterranean region um, and i i think what is relevant for today's discussion is what we're doing to help um, a number of countries uh, develop uh, what we call the market opening for renewables in other words uh, developing um, the the private to private private or the corporate ppa market uh, in those countries and also working towards a more uh, total a more uh, comprehensive market opening which would in in uh, in time hopefully allow for regulatory conversions as uh, moez was mentioning earlier with the eu and the eu aki um this is the first uh, point. Uh, so today, what I'd like to, to discuss and, and focus more is on Egypt, because a lot, of, a lot has been said to this morning on Maghreb, but uh, I thought that uh, uh, Ibiadi, we could speak about Egypt. So the starting point, of course, is in 2014, when there were some uh, huge, um, uh, huge uh, power cuts in Egypt. And at that moment, the government in Egypt uh, started to uh, develop and have ambitious uh, goals for renewable energy. And um, it also developed some gas plants, but renewable energy has been one of the focus of the government. And uh, uh, of course, I'm sure you're familiar with the Benban solar plant, which was completed in about uh, um, 24 months after closing. It's the largest solar plant in uh, in Africa still today, and uh, and a number of entities, including uh, of course the World Bank group, was so today uh, Egypt has 
uh, almost six uh, a gigawatt of installed capacity uh, in uh, renewables. Actually, the numbers here are from 2020, so it's a bit higher now. And there is, um, and it is expected that Egypt will reach this year their target of reaching 20% of installed capacity of renewable energy by 2022. So when one, with one year uh, in advance of the target. And so there is, um, uh, there is a potential, um, there is a potential for uh, Egypt's renewable energy capacity to be used for export and for trading in the Mediterranean area. And I think this is, uh, this is, of course, something which is critical um, because, as, as was said a few times already this morning, um, interconnection energy trading today uh, means renewable energy trading. And so uh, this is where EBRD, our focus has been in, in Egypt. So uh, one more consideration on the context in Egypt. Uh, we have uh, what we call new challenges, but actually these can be new opportunities for, uh, for uh, for the electricity trading, there is a surplus of power. Uh, we estimate about 27 gigawatt, but there are different estimates, so please don't quote me uh, on this. And the the overcapacity is likely to uh, to remain for <laughs> for a while, especially as Egypt is committed to uh, build new capacity of renewable energy to meet their target of 42 percent by 2035 of renewable energy, which means effectively doubling the capacity today uh, while there is an overcapacity. So there is a real, real opportunity here for to develop energy trading. So I want to stop uh, now on, 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 the, on, the, on, this, on this slide uh, a, bit, uh, a bit longer, although I won't be too long. Um, I think there are three uh, big conditions for electricity trading for Egypt. And I have to say, most of this has been said also for the other countries in the region. The first, uh, the first constraint, of course, is physical infrastructure. Uh, today, there is an interconnector with Jordan. Uh, there is also a small interconnector with Libya, uh, we understand. There are plans to develop interconnection with Saudi Arabia, with Sudan, um, uh, but those physical infrastructure need to be uh, built, need to be financed, uh, 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 and, and these, are, uh, these can take a lot of time. More complex are the interconnectors with uh, the European Union. There are a number of different uh, uh, initiatives. One of them called Euro-Africa seems to be the most advanced, which, uh, which is a 1300 kilometers link to Cyprus and Crete and then uh, Greece, Attica, uh, the, the mainland. Um, and this project, which is a uh, two gigawatt uh, in, in both direction, um, is, is a project which is, uh, which is under development. But of course, as we all know, these projects are very complex. You have complex environmental uh, aspects, you have complex geopolitical aspects, you have complex um, uh, financing and, uh, and, uh, and contractual dimensions. So these, uh, uh, these are, uh, these are the, the, the challenges, physical infrastructure. The second, uh, one more aspect, which is sometimes overlooked is, the, uh, is, is how, you know, compatibility of the different grid systems. Uh, it's been mentioned in the first panel this morning, but uh, of course, if you look at Egypt, Egypt is only uh, now developing smart grid systems. They're building, uh, um, um, I think, 16 uh, automated control centers throughout the country. Smart uh, meters are being rolled out, but there. There is, a, there is a digital gap between uh, the EU market may be an issue for future electricity uh, uh, trading. Of course, I mentioned the fact that today, if, we, if Egypt wants to export to the EU, it also needs to increase the renewable energy capacity, and that also takes time and investment. The second uh, big uh, uh, challenge 
and uh, condition for electricity trading uh, is the regulatory convergence. Again, this has been uh, mentioned a lot. Uh, the, the maybe one main point, maybe two points, which I don't think have so much been uh, mentioned. The first one is that um, today in Egypt and, uh, uh, and I would say in most of the countries in North Africa, there is no uh, energy, domestic energy market. And so if, uh, if we want uh, uh, Egypt to be integrated and have some interconnection with the EU in a sustainable and long-term way, there will need to be some form of, um, of convergence and uh, hence development of the energy market in Egypt. And this is something that EBRD, we are engaged with the regulator in Egypt, Egypt Terra, to assist. And I'll just, I'll just uh, uh, come back quickly on this on my next slide. The second, the second dimension, which I think um, I'm not sure has been uh, mentioned, is the fact that uh, um, since the power that will be exported from Egypt to uh, the European Union uh, will be green energy, there has to be a methodology to certify that the, the, uh, the electricity is green. And there has to be, as a result, some form of um, introduction in Egypt of the EU rules for uh, guarantee of origin and green certification. And this is something which uh, we, we're looking, uh, we've also um, looking at this in Morocco uh, uh, to, to assist the, the government there. The third, the third aspect, of course, is demand. Um, Neighboring countries such as Jordan suffer from uh, overcapacity. So the question is, uh, where is the export market for Egypt? I think Sudan is probably a different case and there is an opportunity for, for export. But of course, political instability, um, physical constraints, uh, you know, geopolitics also play a role which, which may affect uh, the trading. Uh, secondly, cost competitiveness. So. Um, the, the whole we all know uh, uh, Egypt has very uh, good wind resources, very good solar resources, but to which extent uh, uh, those that power can be um, competitive if they if it's uh, delivered on the European spot market, uh, considering that the the cost of the the under undersea cable needs to be. Uh, factored in, and this is, I think, a, a, a big, a big question. Um, I'm going to go quickly on the conditions for energy trading in Egypt within on the market opening. This is something EBRD is uh, assisting the regulator in Egypt on with our with a consultant uh, DNV, and here you can see on the slide of a list of a number of tasks that still need to be done to uh, to uh, to open the market and allow that regulatory convergence that I mentioned earlier and this gives you a bit the an idea of the work that still needs to be done to reach the stage where electricity uh, trading can happen between uh, the EU system and uh, and Egypt uh, uh, and uh, it involves uh, uh, of course the unbundling of the of the system it uh, involves, um, you know, private generators to uh, to 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 sign a bilateral contracts uh, in the competitive market. Uh, I see Benoit is uh, turning on, so I'm just uh, just thank you very much, and that's that will be it for me. Thank you. No, th thank you very much for for this uh, uh, very interesting presentation, and and uh, we see how much the EBRD is involved in the in the region. Well, one uh, one point and which relates to the, the question about this interconnection uh, with, with with Greece in the um, to, to get a little bit more into the details in terms of project financing uh, you mentioned the, the importance of interconnections and, and cross-border exchanges what could be the role of EU in terms of PPAs and so on do you see that as an important lever to the development of uh, renewables. You mentioned the integration within the spot market. How do you see the articulation between long-term agreements and spot market, where as well probably also the long-term stability is something very important to, to 
deliver in the end. Oh, you're muted. Um, so um, I, I think that uh, the EU has a role in making these projects happen so the the undersea cable interconnector and in fact it is playing a role which is quite uh, significant today uh, if i if i understand but uh, i'm sure some colleagues know better than me um, uh, the this uh, the project the euro africa project has been classified a project of common interest already so that unblocks some grants but also some political involvement, diplomatic involvement uh, across the, the, the Mediterranean to get the project uh, out of ground. So on a project basis, I think uh, the EU will play a critical role in making things happen, both with financing, but also with a number of different uh, uh, ways. Um, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, how the power which uh, uh, hits the EU a region will be uh, commercialized, will be sold. I think if I take for one second my hat as a bank, of course, what I would expect and what I hope is that there will be some form of long-term PPAs because this is the only way uh, a, 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 you know, a project finance of this size can be really uh, structured with, with long-term uh, uh, leverage. And uh, a long-term PPA with with a, with a with a tariff which is uh, acceptable. Um, referring uh, to uh, referring to uh, an, an example Moez gave earlier on El Med in Tunisia, I think in that case, but uh, Moez can maybe correct me. There will be also a question as to how if the infrastructure could be amortized under the regulated asset base of. Uh, the the utility on the other side on the European side uh, of the of the um, of the picture and so where we could rely not only on on a long on the cash flows from a, from a, from a long term PPA but in this case from the um, the the regulated uh, revenues under you know the regulated asset base of the of the tso uh, the third model of course is just to rely on the spot market and there uh, i think uh, the question of the of the the profitability and the the competitiveness of the of the you know egyptian solar resources and for that matter i would say uh, um, uh, maghreb solar resources or or wind resources will will need to compete with uh, with the other alternatives uh, available thank you for your your answer um i think that we uh, we uh, we are much uh, <laughs> well, we, we we are very late so maybe i propose to, to close this session now um and uh, well i want to warmly thank all the uh, participants to this round table and for this Ex these very interesting exchanges. I hope that the, the uh, attendees uh, enjoyed this uh, this discussion as much as I did. Thank you. And then uh, I, I give back the floor to uh, I don't know Angelo if you are coordinating then the end. And then I think that we have uh, Olivier Antoine then uh, proposing a, a presentation. Thank, thank you very much, um, Benoit. Uh, yes, indeed, we are a bit out of time. Uh, by the way, I have seen a lot of questions uh, that have been addressed by the attendees. Uh, uh, it's a pity we are not able to uh, uh, answer to all these questions. What we can do, uh, if it's acceptable, is to try to give answers uh, uh, after this uh, this uh, uh, webinar, but uh, it it's very important for me to understand that there was a lot of interest, that there are a lot of questions uh, and uh, uh, a lot of work to do. But to follow, and uh, yeah. actually, that 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 shows that this kind of workshop is important, and maybe we could uh, we could uh, schedule the, another yeah. one to complement this one. Yeah, a second, a second, a second session. Yeah, we have, a second we have already uh, two more uh, scheduled already, Benoit, for this year. Indeed, uh, but in line with this topic, I mean, as a so, compliment. Uh, 
anyway. Uh, anyhow, so according now to the agenda of the webinar, uh, there is another important aspect that in some way tries to answer uh, uh, to some of, some of the expectations uh, on which this webinar is based. Uh, we as METSO are launching a survey uh, as one of the identified activities we are developing in the uh, TCMED project. And this survey that's addressed to all uh, the uh, regional stakeholders uh, is aimed at identifying the key areas of for harmonization of, for a future, of a future Mediterranean grid code. It is an activity that we are developing together with, with Angie. So I would leave uh, the floor to uh, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Olivier uh, Antoine from Engie that should introduce uh, this uh, uh, important activity we are launching in the next days. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to to attend this uh, this workshop and to present uh, uh, this uh, launch of the survey. So I, I will try to to not take too much of, of your time to go through the survey. Um, okay, let me uh, sorry, Olivier, can, can you come closer to the mic, please? Okay, is it better? Uh, yes. Okay, uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, um, so the presentation is, is really about the launch of uh, a survey. Um, and the main goal of this survey is to identify uh, key areas for harmonization of a, uh, a potential future Mediterranean grid code. So um, it's, it's, it's really during this survey that we will ask the opinion of all the stakeholders on what are the implementation uh, barriers and what are the areas to be harmonized to facilitate interconnection and uh, ultimately uh, a market and energy exchange. So in this presentation, it will be quite short and it will be about 10 minutes. I will uh, present you what is the, uh, the, the context and background of the study, what METTSO has already done a lot of studies about this topic. So I would like to share some learning with you and then practically how the survey uh, will be performed. So the key objective of this, this, this part of the study is to identify uh, key priority areas to be harmonized. Uh, it could be on the, on the connection uh, technical requirements, market technical requirements, on the legal aspect, on the operational aspect. Uh, and from that, we will propose uh, some guidelines for some key uh, technical aspects that needs to be considered uh, for harmonization and potentially in a, in a grid code. So the goal of this project is not to come with a, um, a very detailed grid code, but at least to list all the articles that should be part of uh, harmonized uh, regulation and also to identify uh, the implementation barrier, which could be technical or non-technical. And finally, uh, there is a roadmap for uh, a tentative implementation of uh, a Mediterranean uh, a grid code. So just to give you an overview of, of this task, we started the study end of last year. Uh, the launch of the survey is now in, in February, uh, and we would like to have uh, the result of the survey and to analyze that by, uh, by April to come with recommendation for METTSO uh, by June this year. So as you can see, there are four tasks in this, uh, in this assignment. I, I will go quickly through, through them. Uh, the first one was to analyze the result uh, of the activities already performed by, by METTSO. So uh, there was already a lot of, do of work performed during Mediterranean Project 1 and Mediterranean Project 2 uh, on analyzing the uh, national regulatory framework in each uh, countries of METTSO, and also some proposal to have common, common target uh, regulatory framework and roadmap to reach this implementation. That, that was mainly in the Mediterranean Project 1. 
in the Mediterranean Project 2, there was also a proposal and um, at the end of this uh, Mediterranean Project 2, there was some identification of pilot project for implementation of a uh, common regulatory framework. And, and this is, is, is very important in this second uh, Mediterranean project. Uh, there was some, a focus more on a zonal approach to have some harmonization between uh, neighboring countries. You will see uh, all the reports are on the MedTSO website and I, I encourage you to, to have a look at that. Um, and a, a very important aspect is that this work has been performed mainly by TSOs. And, and, and this is why today we launched this, this survey because the point of view of TSO is very important, but of all other stakeholders, so energy producer, uh, project developer, uh, industrial uh, customer, and so on, it, it's very important. And, and we need that survey to verify if the key priority areas are the same for all stakeholders. So th that's why we launched uh, this survey, which has two goals. The first one is to give a, a clear picture of what has been done um, by METTSO in the, in, in the past years. And the, the second goal is to identify key priority areas uh, common to all stakeholders. Um, so in practice, we will send the survey in which will be split into different categories. Um, so connection, operation, market, and uh, legal and regulatory. Uh, important, we will send a survey, but it's possible to complement the survey with interviews, uh, online interviews uh, and, uh, with, uh, with key stakeholders. So that's, that's important to get really uh, an understanding of the, of the survey. Um, so then we will analyze the survey report. Um, and in practice, as I said, we will, um, we will give interviews. Important, we will aggregate answer by type of stakeholder and by region. So it will not be, uh, um, it's, a, it's a kind of anonymous survey. We will aggregate the answer to verify if we have the same priority areas for uh, each type of stakeholder and that's in the different region of the Mediterranean. And that's very important to go forward and to give a uh, recommendation towards a, a roadmap for implementation. And at the end of the project, we will uh, propose some guidelines, which will be mainly, um, as we said, the semantic structure of the grid code, but also identification of the main implementation barrier. Um, okay, I will not go through all the details, uh, so you, you can have, a, uh, I think, a view on, on the background of this project. Um, the main learning of the previous uh, MedTSO project, we have a report that we will share at the same time as we send the survey. So that gives more background for all stakeholders on what has already been done. The main conclusion from the previous work of METISO um, is that all regulatory aspects do not need to be harmonized, but some are very key and have higher priorities. And this, okay, uh, there was a list of priorities identified by TSOs, but we need to have the point of view of other stakeholders. Also, zonal harmonization could be a good solution, uh, but that's also need to be confirmed via the survey. Uh, it's on, not only technical, but also regulatory and institutional barrier, which overcome this uh, to have a common regulatory framework. Uh, and, and, and the goal is not here at the end of, the, of this project to, to, to provide binding rules, but rather uh, guidelines for facilitating um, energy exchange. Um, and in this study, we really want to engage with uh, other stakeholders. And that's, that's very important in the launch of the survey, this stakeholder engagement. And basically, we want to see what are the key priority areas, uh, let's say, for uh, ensuring interconnected operation. Then what are the minimum set of rules to ensure an ex energy exchange? And also, what are the minimum set of rules to ensure a single market? And we, we would like to capture uh, those key priority areas uh, uh, via the survey. So in practice, how will it work? Um, the survey will be sent to, to, to various stakeholders of the Mediterranean uh, region uh, after this meeting and uh, up to the end of the week. Um, so it will be different type of stakeholders, regulators, industrial, TSOs, 
uh, association of uh, uh, manufacturer, for example, um, producer. Uh, the format is a, is a simple Excel spreadsheet where you need to fill the answer and, and give the answer back to us. Um, the response will be aggregated uh, by type of stakeholder and by region. So for us, it will be easier to draw a conclusion uh, depending on the type of stakeholder and, 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 um, and regional location. And um, as I say, the focus in the, is on the identification of the key priority areas and implementation barrier uh, for several objectives, so interconnected operation, energy exchange, and uh, market. So in, in practice, uh, you will receive uh, an Excel file with some uh, tabs, as you can see. Uh, there's the README, which ex explains how to fill the survey, uh, progress tab, which show uh, how many questions you have to fill. Uh, and then we have uh, a split between general, legal, connection, market, and operation. Um, and in each of those tabs, you will have specific questions related to, um, to those aspects. Most of the questions should be answered by um, a number between zero or nine to have an idea of uh, the if, if the aspect has to be harmonized or, or is not very relevant uh, for you as a stakeholder. There are also a few open questions. Uh, as example, uh, in the general ta tab, we will ask you uh, which stakeholder group do you represent and in which region you have most of your activities. Uh, there, was, there will be also some uh, multiple choice question uh, on what do you expect that increased interconnection will bring, what are the main bar barriers for increased energy exchange, uh, and open question. You have always the, the possibility to comment your answer, which is very important because it's difficult to capture all the information from a multiple choice. So it's always possible to provide additional information. There are uh, in total um, a, a bit more than 100 questions, but most of them are a multiple choice. Uh, so answering from zero to nine. Um, so that should take less than one hour to complete. Uh, so hopefully, and I encourage most of you to, uh, to complete and to provide answer. As I said, the survey can be followed on request or if we, if we, if we need additional information uh, to have a short interview via conference call, 30 to 30 minutes to one hour, uh, which is very important to, to get more information on, uh, on the priority areas of each stakeholder. Uh, the, the goal is really to capture the, this point and to, to have the most objective uh, set of uh, of key uh, rules to, to be harmonized. That, that's really, the, the goal is really to be as objective as possible and to have uh, the point of view of all stakeholders. So uh, the final slides, um, the, so the expected outcome of this is really, as I say, identified key areas, um, also identified potential disagreements between stakeholders, which are very good uh, to, to identify and to see what are the action to, um, to, to, to harmonize uh, and to, to, to solve this. Um, also identify potential regional trends. As we discussed today, it's not exactly the same uh, configuration in the Maghreb or, or more in, in the Middle East or around Egypt, uh, Libya, um, and Jordan. Um, and, and that's why it's very key to receive as much and answer uh, as we can from a wide panel of, of stakeholders. Uh, we would expect responses on the survey in, in four weeks time, so around the 6th of March. Um, if you have any question on, on that, uh, you can directly contact me via email, or if you have question on, on more the METI, so activities, uh, you can contact uh, Luca. So thank you. Uh, that was it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Olivier. Um, I think we are at the end of this very interesting webinar. I see still a lot of people who remain until the end that uh, once more to, uh, 
uh, testifying the interest uh, received by this uh, webinar. So from my side, I can only thank everybody, thank the speakers, thanks the moderators, thanks all the attendees for uh, their support. <clears throat> for sure, uh, we will uh, continue in organizing similar events and more than the events, we will continue working on, on this topic. Uh, Hassan, uh, thanks to Medreg, of course, for uh, cooperating in organizing this uh, workshop. Uh, the final words are yours. Thank you very much, Angelo. Uh, I also would like to thank to MedPSO for this uh, really fruitful uh, organization. And I also would like to thank to our speakers, uh, to participants, uh, the moderators. And to me, it has been a very fruitful and useful uh, discussions. Uh, I am sure that we would be able to organize the, the next two, uh, let's say the activities jointly will be organized between MEDREC and METIA. So within this year, hopefully physically. So uh, of course, uh, uh, seeing that uh, there are uh, several uh, developments in different regions, uh, but uh, I'm so glad and it's very interesting that they are moving ahead in parallels. So basically with the view to ensuring an integrated and interoperated system uh, in the region uh, with the view to uh, enabling uh, the electricity exchange and the trading. Uh, among others, uh, it has been also highlighted that uh, the, the regulatory convergence is utmost importance in order to, uh, in order to attain these uh, long-term objectives. So uh, once more, thanks a lot to everyone and uh, hopefully see you soon physically in uh, other joint activities. Many thanks.